one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Hello, here's Geo. And today, we'll go into outer space. More than half a century has passed since the most standout space successes of mankind. The first satellite, the first man in orbit, flights to the moon. Each of these events has left such incredibly massive footprint in history. It is difficult to imagine modern life without a space program. GPS, the internet, television, all this is mainly based on hundreds of extremely complex devices that orbit around the Earth. But we perceive this not as a miracle, but as an everyday reality. People think more about the Roman Empire than about space. But that wasn't the case in the middle of the 20th century. Back then, conquest of space was a matter of national prestige, not just the accomplishment of some practical tasks. It was necessary to put a man on a rocket just to put a man on a rocket, not to get some important scientific data or set up a navigation system of some kind. But don't you think that I'm trying to dismiss the achievements of the first astronauts and cosmonauts? They did other kinds of tasks and paved the way for modern technologies. At that time, no one hid that the first space programs were prestige programs or challenge programs. That's what they were called in the US. Today I would like to tell you about how the American lunar program Apollo appeared, why no expense was spared on it, and why so many people refused to believe that Americans were indeed on the moon. The Apollo story is an outstanding technical achievement, and it's valuable, not because it has delivered some practical benefit, Sometimes symbolic things are no less important for the development of civilization. For 15 years, the Apollo was a mirror in which the world saw the face of America. There was daring romance, incredible cynicism, outstanding technological capabilities and sometimes their incorrect application. Even then, the US economy was the most advanced in the world. But it still wasn't enough to provide for the lunar program. And when the propaganda goals were achieved, and it was necessary to proceed to scientific work, the Apollo flights were cancelled, because taxpayers no longer understood such jokes. Here's the first man on the moon, that's cool, that's great. But why the second, the third, the tenth? It's difficult, it's unclear. Well, let's figure out. How come the US could successfully send astronauts so far from the Earth? And why they don't fly there anymore? Сколько бы документальных фильмов не было снято про Луну, споры о том, кто первый на нее приземлился, будут продолжаться и продолжаться и продолжаться. Но у нас Новый год на носу. Не охота спорить, охота делать подарки близким и делать это максимально выгодно. Для этого есть крутая кредитка Тиньков Платин. Оформите ее до конца декабря, совершите покупки на сумму от 3000 рублей в течение 30 дней с момента активации и получите 1000 рублей кэшбэка на карту. Вот, например, купили вы другу наушники за 2000 рублей, сестре книгу за 1000 рублей, а для племянника новый рюкзак за 2000 рублей. Итого, вы потратили 4000 рублей. Почему 4? Да потому что 1000 рублей вернется кэшбэком. А еще вернется до 30% кэшбэка по спецпредложениям банка, который вы можете потратить, оплатив счет в ресторане, услуги ЖКХ, билеты на поезд и многое другое. У Тиньков Платинум кредитный лимит до 1 миллиона рублей. Рассрочка до 12 месяцев на любые покупки. Бесплатные переводы на карты любых банков до 50 тысяч рублей в месяц без подписки. А с подпиской Тиньков Про до 100 тысяч рублей. 
Переходите по ссылке в описании и успейте оформить карту Тиньков Платину до 31 декабря, чтобы получить кэшбэк 1000 рублей при покупке от 3000. Кто был первый на Луне, решите сами. А кто первый по кэшбэку, я думаю, Тиньков. Обычной атмосферы нет. Атмосфера праздника есть. And by the way, I'm interested in the topic of space right now, so I'm planning to make another big release. I would also like to tell you in detail about Gagarin's flight. I think it's quite interesting in the context of popularization because it's quite exciting. If you like this idea, comment down below. So, how did they come up with the idea to not just fly into space, but specifically to the moon? I won't draw my own conclusions, because I'd have to do extensive historical research then, and I'm not a historian. So I'll rely on two books. The Truth About the Apollo Program by Yaroslav Golovanov, and The Last Man on the Moon by Eugene Cernan. So if you wish to learn more, you should read books. It's hard to say, but basically, the trigger for the launch of the Apollo program was the fact that in 1957, the Soviet Union launched the world's first artificial satellite. There was no scientific revolution on this occasion. I mean, the possibility of a satellite was theoretically justified a long time ago. People understood how to launch it. Even science fiction writers argued, not in the spirit of Jules Verne, but quite in the spirit of modern science at that time. In the middle of the 20th century, the first full-fledged calculations appeared. Both the US and Soviet Union made no secret that launching a satellite was a matter of time, although back then it wasn't considered a competition between countries. In the United States, at the end of 48th year, it was officially announced that they were preparing to launch a device into orbit soon. Moreover, just a couple of months later, American engineers started designing a genuine manned spacecraft. So, no one had even been able to throw a simple piece of iron into space, and suddenly the construction of a ship with an astronaut began, just think about it. However, it was still a long way to the real ship. The satellite was still a priority. In the 55th year, the White House announced to the whole country that it was about to come soon. At the beginning of the 57th, an official speech was also made at the Astronaut Symposium. So when on October 4th of the same year, the USSR suddenly announced that in fact the Soviet satellite was already flying in orbit and beeping, everyone mildly speaking was blown away. An American magazine wrote that same day, we did not expect a Soviet satellite. Thus, it gave Eisenhower's America the impression of a new technical Pearl Harbor. The day before, President Eisenhower went on a short vacation to play golf. Suddenly, he was called and said one phrase. The Soviets launched a satellite. The president immediately boarded a plane and flew back to Washington. And the famous rocket scientist Werner von Braun sadly remarks, well, now a real hell will burst out in Washington. And he was right. All radio stations interrupted broadcasts and broadcasted beep beep from a Soviet satellite. Along with the sound, stocks on the stock exchange rapidly fell. Rumors were spread about the oncoming destruction of New York. Priests predicted the end of the world. Ordinary Americans perceived satellites not as a simple piece of iron in orbit, but as a horseman of apocalypse. But why? Well, that's because in the American mind, even among high officials and scientists, the USSR was still an outsider. The US was considered an advanced country in all respects, including scientific and technical. It seems that no one even came up with the idea that someone else might have their own successful space program. Well, it turned out it very well could. The satellite of the 57th year became the collapse of the national American myth. Major newspapers published articles with pessimistic headlines, such as the decline of our superpower era, which stated that America is no longer all-powerful and invulnerable. However, all things considered, what really happened? Was American's panic mode reasonable? 
Of course not. The Soviet satellite did not change anything either in the context of power or in foreign policy. It means the reality hasn't changed in any way. Only the image of the United States was damaged. The problem for the United States wasn't technical now, but internal. How can Americans regain confidence in themselves and in their country? Launching a satellite wouldn't help here anymore. Only some bright events remain a sensation and a breakthrough in the mass consciousness. Better the pioneer ones. No matter how much effort and money were put into achieving the goal, it doesn't affect the psychological effect. If only America had sent a satellite into space at least one hour earlier than the Soviets, then it would have been possible to relax, the citizens would have been satisfied. But it didn't happen. So the government had to try hard to create a wow effect for amateurs, so that one morning people can hear on the radio that the United States is again ahead of the curve and calm down. A very expensive psychotherapy session was needed nationwide. But before that, it was necessary to understand how the USSR got ahead. President Eisenhower told reporters that the Red Army captured all German scientists during the war. Thanks to Germans, the Soviets were able to develop a space program. But there's one thing. Eisenhower seemed to have very successfully forgotten that when he was a general himself, not the president, he personally signed an order to capture German rocket scientists at any cost. About 500 scientists were taken to America, led by the chief designer of the world's first V-2 ballistic rocket, Werner von Braun. It's von Braun who's directly called the father of American cosmonautics. He developed a bunch of different rockets for the United States, from Jupiter-S that launched the first American satellite into orbit, to Saturn V, which would later launch astronauts to the moon. The USSR of course involved captured specialists from Germany in their work. But the United States did the same thing. Therefore, the participation of Germans in the project wasn't the key to the Soviet Union's success. It was a way to not acknowledge the problem but to dismiss it. Like it's not the achievement of the USSR, others did everything for them. This was only one side of the spectrum. On the other hand, there was some kind of unhealthy adoration, almost deification of the Soviet education system. Look at America, they said. It lacks teachers. Children don't want to study. They just watch color TV all day long. What a degradation. Look at the USSR. There are no color TVs. That's the reason why our kids are smart. The father of the hydrogen bomb Edward Teller wrote, that a huge number of young people in America weren't intelligent. And the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, Strauss, expressed himself even more harshly as not a single education institution in America where even the most talented student could receive as good training as Russians receive. Objectively speaking, that wasn't true as well. Technical education in Soviet Union was good indeed, but not so good that Americans could blame theirs. After all, they were the first to invent the atomic bomb and their poor higher education didn't prevent them from doing it. It was a kind of excuse on behalf of scientists who were forced to justify themselves to politicians. Well, the politicians themselves started beating each other up, mostly President Eisenhower. It was said that America's lag in space was a secret conspiracy of the communists in the fifth column. And who's to blame for this? The president, of course president who isn't eager enough to seek out traitors and generally governs the country badly, especially since he couldn't use the technical power of the state and allowed his main opponents to get ahead of himself. And so, it became clear that the space program quickly turned from a scientific and technical project into politics. The future president, Lyndon Johnson, spoke about this almost right up front. I don't believe that this generation of Americans wants to come to terms with the situation when they have to go to bed every night by the light of the communist's moon. And so while the debates and blame games continued in Washington, industrialists and bankers were already rubbing their hands. They understood that the government's elimination of the LAC program would soon become the main one, even considering that there was no special lag in fact. But the big business already understood that no one would care about national arguments. 
therefore, huge investments can be expected. Soon afterwards, the famous term space race appeared. In fact, the name itself already contains a point that its main driving force is national prestige, not scientific goals. No one has ever hidden this. Even during reports of various government commissions, in the first place officials were interested in the question when, not why. Notice, I still haven't answered the question how did it happen that the USSR was the first to launch a satellite. In fact, there's no mystery here. It's all about the Cold War. There were many countries around the Soviet Union with American military bases, where bombers with atomic weapons were stationed. The Soviet Union could not answer in kind. Therefore, they did their best to create an intercontinental ballistic rocket, which in fact doesn't care where to be launched from. The R-7 rocket appeared in the 57th year in the construction office of Sergei Karolov. Even during elaboration, Karolov realized that an artificial satellite could be launched into Earth orbit with the same rocket. And he did it in 43 days. Because why not? In our case, the satellite wasn't the goal. It turned out to be a byproduct of work on a military rocket. By the way, not for the last time. In the future, Soviet spaceships will arise from military equipment. But let's go back to Americans. In short, if there hadn't been the fact that the Soviet Union was the first to send satellite into orbit, then perhaps there wouldn't have been the lunar program. Or rather it would, but not within the context of competition, and it wouldn't have attracted such huge attention. But back then, American engineers had to literally be ahead of time and spend billions of dollars just for show-offs and a record. How did it all start? Ten days after the launch of the Soviet satellite, President Eisenhower had a conversation with the Minister of Defense in his office. Instead of celebrating his birthday, Eisenhower decided to talk about the way they could catch up with the USSR and be in advance of it. One of the most fateful decisions was the creation of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Its abbreviated name is known all over the world today. NASA. It didn't happen at once. First, they had to at least send a satellite into orbit. In December of 57, the year, a rocket with a device under the proud name Avangard was launched. The launch was postponed several times, but on December 6, everything finally worked out. The engines roared. A column of smoke and fire hit from under the rocket. The massive structure lifted off the ground, blew off, kind of farted a little bit, and collapsed onto the concrete. Explosion, screams, complete chaos. 200 journalists who were supposed to watch the triumph of American cosmonautics took a bunch of photos of its shame. It was another nail in the Republican government's and President Eisenhower's coffin. I think the future Democratic President Johnson felt gloating delight when he called this launch a tacky gamble that ended to be one of the most publicized and humiliating failures of the US history. Well, in general, we can agree with this. Not only did they fail the championship, but also couldn't try successfully. The international prestige of the United States has probably never been at such low level. America was able to launch the satellite only two months later, on January 31 in 1958. It was a small device, weighing 14 kilograms, quite a modest progress, given the fact that the USSR had already sent an entire ship into space with the dog on board. However, the minimum task was completed. The United States finally became a space power. But it's obvious that this wasn't enough. America needed not only to catch up with the Soviet Union, but also to overtake it literally in one leap. Such overtake sounds like a paradox. But nevertheless, this was exactly the task Eisenhower set for the military and scientists. In the year 58, the United States barely launched a satellite, but already began to develop a rocket that could send a ship to the moon. At first, everything went awful. At that time, there was no common management of the space program in America. Each major military department had its own programs and its own engineers. For example, the first American satellite was launched into orbit by sailors. But there were specialists from the Air Force that worked with them. In the year 58, they tried to launch their device three times, but all three attempts ended in accidents. And USSR was ahead without any apparent efforts. 
In September 1959, the Luna 2 ship successfully delivered the Soviet coat of arms to the lunar surface. In fact, it was a simple dummy without its own engine, which was shot at the moon. But it did hit. For the national prestige, that was more than enough. And so, America had to change something. The first step was the creation of NASA to collect all the developments in one place. It wasn't so easy because the military didn't want to give up on their programs and let engineers work in a strange new structure, better yet civilian one. They tried their best to delay the process and assured that the missiles could be used for military purposes. So they had to control the process. But NASA had something the military didn't have. Money. Lots of money. They could simply buy any specialist. 8,000 employees from the Committee of Aeronautics quickly went there. 2,000 from the California Institute of Technology. 200 engineers from the Navy, who had previously been engaged in launching the first American satellite into orbit. And most importantly, NASA got the Ballistic Rocket Control Design Department at its disposal. That is, the project of Warner von Braun, the main German-American rocket scientist. So, the money is there. The stuff is there. What's next? It was obvious that the next step should be a human spaceflight. For this purpose, NASA developed two programs at once. A single-seat Mercury ship and two-seat Gemini. What's more, it was necessary to try with redoubled force. By that time, everyone already understood that the USSR was winning the race and was preparing its first manned flight. Engineers were also sent from the White House. The newspapers wrote that, from the propaganda point of view, the first man in space is worth perhaps more than a hundred divisions, or a dozen intercontinental ballistic rockets that are ready to take off at the first order. The selection of the first astronauts has also begun. The requirements were strict. The candidate must be a professional pilot, no older than 40 years old, and flew at least one and a half thousand hours. Also, he must have absolute health, height less than 188 centimeters, and a university degree. At first, 500 people were selected, but after additional tests and checkouts, only seven remained. Almost all of them will somehow visit space, and one even fly to the moon. You know what's especially interesting about this? The Americans began recruiting astronauts much earlier than the Soviets. I mean, they had a space squad ready even when a working rocket didn't exist yet. Soviet cosmonauts, along with Gagarin, were recruited only a year later, and they almost immediately trained on a real Vostok ship. Back in the USA, according with the plan to overtake without catching up, a rocket for flights to the moon was developed simultaneously with orbiters. The same Werner von Braun managed this project. In September 1959, the Ministry of Defense and NASA conducted a comparative study of powerful accelerators, because of which the Saturn system was recognized as the most promising tool capable of providing the United States with the opportunity to send heavy ships into space as soon as possible. The Saturn S-1 project was approved on January 18 in 1960, and it was recognized as the highest priority in the country. It was a significant step to the entire future program. The United States government relied a lot on it. Because there was little hope that the Americans would manage to launch the first man, into space. Seemed like everyone already accepted that the Soviet Union is unlikely to be overtaken in the short term. On April 12, in 1961, it became obvious that America's only hope of getting ahead was long and hard work on the lunar project. Everything else was bound to be secondary. Especially, the authority in the White House has changed. John F. Kennedy understood what was coming. So in his election program, he talked about space. He criticized Republicans for failing to ensure America's superiority. He said that he would make cosmonautics the basis of his course. People of the world witnessed that the Soviet Union was the pioneer to enter space. Its satellites were the first to fly around the moon and the sun. They made a conclusion that the Soviet Union is rising while we are running in place. I think it's time for us to change this opinion. It's worth noting that Kennedy really thought so.
According to his advisor's memoirs, the president believed that America's secondary role in space did not correspond to its role as a world leader. On the April of 12, in 1961, when the news of Gagarin's flight ran all over the world, Kennedy looked undisturbed. Unlike Eisenhower, he didn't babble incoherent nonsense about German scientists and the best Soviet education in the world. He told reporters that everything was under control and that America's efforts would be accelerated. Kennedy felt that the national pride of Americans was severely hurt and tried to find a common idea that would delight everyone and bring everyone out of anxious state. It had to be a super leap, a super breakthrough, a super task, anything. But it had to be super. A flight to the moon perfectly fitted it. Kennedy regularly held long meetings with NASA executives to get into the details of the space program. He was interested in everything. How are things really going with American cosmonautics? Is it true that the best efforts being made? What should be done to fly to the moon? Is there any program where the USA can count on the championship? The answer to the last question was straightforward. No. The only hope was for the moon. Until then, America is doomed to be on the sidelines in terms of space. The first American astronaut, Alan Shepard, followed Gagarin in less than a month. But who cared? Moreover, Shepard didn't fly around the Earth, but jumped out of the atmosphere for literally 15 minutes. Of course that was important, thanks to everyone involved. But the management was concerned about another issue. Just three days after that launch, a detailed plan for how America would send a man to the moon was laid on Kennedy's desk. This was the first serious case that the new head of NASA, James Webb, was working on. That same Webb that the largest space telescope is named after. This man in many ways impersonated the difference between Soviet and American cosmonautics. In the USSR, leading positions were held by scientists and engineers. For example, Karolov mentioned before devoted decades of his life to rocket science. And he wasn't the only one. But in the United States, scientists were directly involved in the development of all sorts of necessary things, but not management. They believed that the head should not be a scientist, but a person with great organizational skills, as well as obvious business cutouts. It wasn't necessary for him to understand technical details. Before NASA, James Webb worked as Deputy Secretary of State at the State Department. He didn't even have a basic technical education. According to his diploma, he was a lawyer. Nevertheless, Kennedy most of all interested on Webb's candidacy because he considered him an administrative genius. In addition, he could promote the President's ideas at NASA. And ideas were quite clear. Finally, if we are to win the battle that is now going on around the world between two systems, if we are to win the battle for people's minds, the latest achievements in space should have made clear to us all the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere, who are attempting to make a determination of which road they should take. Recognizing the head start obtained by the Soviets with their large rocket engines, which gives them many months of lead time, and recognizing the likelihood that they will exploit this lead for some time to come and still more impressive successes, we nevertheless are required to make new efforts on our own. For while we cannot guarantee that we shall one day be first, we can guarantee that any failure to make this effort will make us last. First, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal, before this decade is out, of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. Our country has thrown its hat over the fence of space, and it has no choice but to follow it. What's with this strange word? Required. Why is it required suddenly? Why should this be done before the end of the decade? There was literally no reason for this. The deadline was chosen absolutely randomly. It was based on Kennedy's desire to certainly defeat the USSR in the race for the moon, and at the same time occupy the thoughts of an ordinary American with something big. So he would wake up in the morning, brush his teeth, get ready for work and think, soon enough we'll fly to the moon. 
Kennedy justified the importance of the lunar program by its prestige, like it's such a cool thing that it's not a pity to spend huge billions from the budget on it. Why is this necessary? Well, not to let USSR be ahead all the time and question our American greatness. And the specific deadline by which the ship was supposed to launch was needed to show that America does not waste words. But Kennedy talked about it so persistently that it started to seem as if he wanted to impose his opinion on everyone. And somehow people don't really like it when something is imposed on them. According to survey in 1961, only 33% of Americans supported Kennedy's view of the need to fly to the moon. Why so few? Well, have you seen how much this flight had cost? For example, the entire Mercury program with the launch of Alan Shepard into space cost $400 million. The Manhattan Project with the development of nuclear bomb cost $2 billion. And for the chance to fly to the moon, Americans were offered to pay $20 billion. Later this number will rise to 25. What for? Even a passionate propagandist of space flights, English astronomer Bernard Lavo, was distressed over the fact that the Apollo project was born not because of the need of science, but because of the embarrassment of American politicians and scientists by the successes of the USSR. He emphasized that there was no rational reason to put a man on the moon by the year 70 and that Soviets were right when they didn't make loud statements about this and gradually worked on their program. From a scientific point of view, it doesn't really matter who will be the first to land on the moon. Принесли? Премиальный ноутбук Tecno Megabook S1. Легкий и тонкий, при этом мощный и производительный. Экран 15,6 дюйма с разрешением 3,2К и частотой обновления 120 Гц. Мощный и производительный процессор 12-го поколения Intel Core i7. Оперативка 16 ГБ и целый терабайт памяти. Хватает для многозадачности с головой. Энергоемкий аккумулятор 70 Вт час. Это передовые технологии с нашей планеты. Так это... И все? Переходите по ссылке в описании и приобретайте премиальный ноутбук Tecno Megabook S1. А я домой. Well, the scientific point of view is not the only one you can look at things from. Politics is no less important than this regard. But there are also different views. Many Republicans spoke out against the lunar program. One of them said that America's victory over unemployment would influence the course of history much better than discovery of the new galaxies. Another senator was even more straightforward. This is a straight up lie, believing in which many Americans sleep peacefully, unaware of their actual fate. Kennedy and his government, with their talk of going to the moon, have not only turned into lunatics themselves, but also want to turn all of us into them. It's not quite clear what the senator meant, but it's clear that he was very annoyed. In general, it's a normal practice when Republicans call the government of Democrats and the other way around. It's unlikely that Kennedy's critics understood exactly what they were criticizing and why. In order to complete the flight to the moon, American scientists had to literally be ahead of time. Usually, these words are used as a metaphor, but not this time. This can be compared to natural childbirth, an artificial, premature one, 
raising a child takes much more effort and attention. Roughly speaking, America needed to jump out of its pants to jump to the moon. By the time this program was approved, the United States neither had a single mother space vehicle, nor single ship, nor single American who had been in space. Therefore, the astronauts had no experience. What your country can do for you. Now let's think about it. I told you that the Apollo program seemed to have many disadvantages. They didn't have this, didn't have that. How did they manage to implement it? Did Kennedy push this decision only based on his charisma? Of course not. If Kennedy had not seen the components of the future flight success, he'd hardly ever talked about the moon at all. But there was a reason why the president was the richest president of the United States. He understood how the gears wheels of big business work. 25 billion is 25 billion. They can't just disappear in thin air. Someone will have to gain them. Money literally outrushed into the aviation industry, electronics and computer technology, metallurgy, chemistry, automation, radio engineering, instrumentation and construction. And obviously the owners of these businesses and departments were all standing up for the Kennedy plan and already considered the potential profit. Well, the military were happy with the lunar program as well, because they got both money and technology. The situation was slightly ironic. It was loudly stated from the podium that the Apollo flights were just a civilian program without any military meaning and potential. But at the same time, the military itself saw this potential. Back in 1959, the Pentagon reported something like this. For political and psychological reasons, it would be a disaster not to be the first on the moon. The refusal to land on the moon is the rejection of the opportunity to defeat the USSR in a race that is already openly recognized as such throughout the world. By the way, why did the Apollo program was called Apollo? The answer is simple, no one knows. It's like Operation Y. Simply one of the directors of NASA made this word up. Because it sounded beautiful. There was no hidden meaning or metaphor. However, the name is not the main thing. Much more important is the place where this Apollo will have to be launched from. The spaceport. Unlike any other construction site, it can be built anywhere. It's always more profitable to launch spacecraft from somewhere near the equator. This will save a lot more energy on launch. NASA was considering options with Hawaii, California, and even the possibility of renting a piece of land somewhere in Africa. In the end, they chose Cape Canaveral in Florida. There were a lot of pros. First, it's not far, in America itself, quite close to the factories that were supposed to produce everything needed for space. Second, no large temperature differences. Third, a safe location. If during the launch, something goes wrong, the rocket will fall into the ocean, not on buildings. Also, it was easy to deliver their massive loads by water, well, to be totally honest, I don't understand why they thought about any other option at all. Because in the point of fact, there has been a missile test site since the 50s. From here, Von Braun launched his V-2. From here, the American satellites were launched. And now the most expensive rocket in history had to be sent straight to the moon from there. The builders were the first to fill the budget billions. Here, among the reeds and mosquitoes, the city of Cape Kennedy began to grow, America's main space gate. And the population grew faster than during the year of gold rush. It increased 10 times in a couple of years, from 24,000 to 265,000. Smaller towns appeared next to the main one. No one thought what would happen to these cities next. Everyone lived for the day. While builders were hastily erecting houses in the middle of nowhere, NASA was choosing a way that would help reach the moon. Strictly speaking, this should have been determined before the start of construction. After all, if they don't know which rocket will be used, then it's not clear for which ship a berth should be built. There were two rockets. I mean, not even rockets, but projects of rockets. Saturn V and Nova. Those two were very different units in their design and concept. Saturn's all-up weight was about 3,000 tons, its diameter 10 meters. 
the Nova was supposed to be even bigger, four and a half tons and 15 meters. The choice of the rocket directly depended on the way the device was supposed to reach the moon. And there were only three. The first way involved the use of a Nova super rocket, which could provide a direct flight along the Earth-Moon-Earth -Earth route. The second and third were based on a more modest and most importantly cheap Saturn V rocket. According to the second option, at first it was necessary to put a space station into Earth orbit, from which the module separated and flew to the Moon. Well, and back at the same order. The module returns from the Moon, joins the main ship, and they land on Earth together. In the third version, no ship flew around the Earth. The whole structure was heading towards the Moon at once. There, one part remained in lunar orbit. Then, the landing module separated from it and landed astronauts on the surface. Probably, some of you may know that the third version actually won. But this doesn't mean it was the most obvious. Every way has its own pros and cons. And the engineers debated passionately about this. For instance, the most reliable way was the direct flight without coupling and separation. There'd be less worry about the control and communication systems. The fewer points in the plan, the less likely that something will go wrong. Generally, everything would be fine if there weren't one problem. 68 tons were required to lift into space. Unthinkable number. For comparison, the option with a spacecraft orbiting the moon required lifting twice as much. And it cost 10% less. Which is a very significant number when it comes to billions. An objective and detailed analysis of all three options show that the third one is the most realistic, taking into account all the opportunities and deadlines. John Hobble voted for it the most. Moreover, he didn't hide that he took this idea from Yuri Kondratuk, a Russian scientist who back in the early 20th century calculated the optimal flight path to the moon. But don't think that this plan was unconditionally supported. The discussions took place in a very tense atmosphere. Once, engineers almost beat each other up, right in front of Kennedy. And when Hobbled was making a report in the White House, one of the other scientists from the audience jumped up and shouted, your numbers are lying. He wants to confuse you. Werner von Braun also didn't stay away. He looked at the calculations and firmly said that it didn't suit them. How did Hobbled win then? He had one supporter, a computer. The machine dispassionately proved over and over again that Hobbled was right. After a year of debate, Werner von Braun began to incline to the same option. The support of the famous rocketeer became crucial and the project was given the green light. Besides, I was talking about only three projects that were working. I mean, they were seriously discussed by serious engineers inside NASA. But there were also speculative options. For example, to give some kind of sensation to the newspapers. One of these belonged to the same Werner von Braun. He went around talking about some completely new revolutionary approach to creating a powerful rocket. And that in just two years he'll be able to build a miracle car when he delivers at least a steam locomotive to the moon. What kind of revolutionary approach it had remained a mystery. No one else thought about him. There were also more exotic offers. To forget about all complex engineering solutions and put a man on the moon. Not even caring about how will he return back. Like, this way will definitely be ahead. The unlucky astronaut would have to live alone on the moon in a special container for as long as it would take to create a system capable of returning him to Earth. Every year he would receive 22 parcels from Earth with supplies of air, water and food. You gotta agree that this option is more suitable for a survival horror story than for an engineering solution. But at least there was an option that the astronaut would actually live. And there were proposals that did not imply this. Take a criminal for example. Will anyone feel sorry for him? Guess not. What are you saying? This is a human sacrifice? Whatever. In return, he will have the glory of Columbus. Anyway, how many people are dying of hunger in Africa? Do you pity them? Then why pity a kamikaze astronaut? Especially considering that he'll die for a greater cause.
Yeah, it's good that no one in NASA seriously thought about such options. After all, in fact, Apollo doesn't consist of sensations, but of daily, tedious work. For the first time, the latest methods of analysis for construction of optimal processes began to be used here, that were performed with the Devil's Machine ECM. Specifically for NASA, they've developed a new program called Nastron. It viewed the spacecraft as a sort of structure consisting of simple elements. This way it was possible to solve many problems. Find a vulnerability in the thing, understand how to better configure the thermoregulation inside the module, and so on. Before, no scientific and technical program was distinguished by such large-scale use of computers. Even the search for specialists was entrusted to computers. The machines also plan organization of production, financing and accounting. And most importantly, if there were no computers, then Apollo would never have flown to the moon, even if the program budget had been double. And I'm not making this up. For example, here are the words of Christopher Kraft, director of the Flight Center in Houston. If I had to choose something that would allow me to switch from Mercury orbital flights to Apollo lunar voyages, I would choose a high-speed computer. Money played a big role as well. NASA got huge budgets and generously ladled them out left and right. But not everyone got the bit, only some. For example, there was a private company, McDonnell Aircraft. It built a flight capsule for the Mercury and then fulfilled orders for Gemini. It also did its part for the lunar program. In total, contracts worth of $4 billion were signed with it. You know who used to be the president of McDonnell Aircraft? James Webb, who was now the head of NASA. And in that new position, he also became a millionaire very quickly. What a way of coincidence. Another similar situation was connected with the construction of the Mission Control Center. I think you're all familiar with the word Houston. Nowadays, the main American space center is located over there. But why did it appear there? Unlike a cosmodrome, it can be built anywhere. And choosing an incredibly hot and humid area in the middle of Texas doesn't seem like the most obvious option. There are several answers. The simplest one is that Rice University donated NASA 160 hectares of land in the middle of prairies. Therefore, NASA didn't have to spend money. It was true, but partly. NASA had so much money that it could build a center right in Manhattan. So there were other reasons. For instance, ties between NASA and US government. Vice President Lyndon Johnson, who was responsible to Kennedy for the lunar program and to whom Webb reported, was originally from Texas and had great connections in local business. Another influential congressman, Albert Thomas, who was also responsible for the NASA budget, was also from Texas. And so, back and forth, little by little, and a space center was already being built in Houston. The lunar program was beginning to take shape. Meanwhile, the astronaut team got new people, including Neil Armstrong. Actually, the total of nine people were selected. Seven of them will become Apollo commanders. Six will visit the whereabouts of the moon. Three will land on it. And two will die. Sitting at the doctor's examination, they didn't know yet that they would become the most popular astronauts in America. But they knew that there were no any Apollos yet. Therefore, they had dived into their work related to Gemini ships, which were intended for flights around the Earth. And I talked a lot that Americans didn't have anything ready for the lunar program. But what did they actually have? They had single-seat Mercury capsules. They even launched it into space. But in the year 63, Mercury flights stopped. And for the next almost two years, Americans didn't fly into space at all. Gemini flights began in the spring of 1965. This ship weighed a lot more and was designed for two astronauts and the Americans have hammered 10 such ships at once. In a few years, they would fly in total 40 days in space. In fact, Gemini has become an excellent base for the lunar program. All future Apollo commanders had previously flown into space on Gemini at least once. So, the project could be considered successful, and most importantly, intense. All Gemini launches were completed in a year and a half. The last such ship flew into space in November 1966, and two months later, ground training began in the first cabin of the Apollo. Yes, it has finally been done. 
In general, all NASA's engineering concerns about the Apollo can be divided into two parts, a ship and a rocket. At different times there were problems with one or other. Calculations show that flight to the moon is possible only with the creation of a powerful Saturn V heavy lift. This three-stage giant with a height of 110 meters could throw about 130 tons into orbit. Initially it was supposed to create several more modest designs, gain experience and work out individual nodes, but the tight deadlines of the program forced to give up on the plan. The first prototype of the ship appeared at the beginning of 1996. It was almost immediately taken to Cape Canaveral and launched into space. Only just to see what's gonna happen. And there was still no rocket by the way. So the launch was carried out using another, a weaker rocket, Saturn 1B. Apparently without any astronauts inside, just in case. The Apollo was supposed to rise 450 kilometers above the Earth and land in the ocean. Along the way it was necessary to measure a bunch of indicators. Aerodynamics, thermal protection and many other things. The start was postponed twice. First liquid hydrogen flowed out of the rocket. Then, four seconds before launch, the pressure in the rocket dropped. Nevertheless, on February 26, the first Apollo finally took off, completed the entire program and was successfully got out by an aircraft carried in the Atlantic. The ship landed four and a half thousand kilometers away from the launch point. That same year, the Saturn 1B rocket was launched two more times. One time with the ship, second time by itself, perhaps to check stability. No serious problems raised. So they started to think about the manned flight. For comparison, the Gagarin's Vostok was checked five times with mannequins and animals before putting a person there. Americans decided to reduce the number of tests. It was already known who would fly on the first Apollo. Virgil Grissom, a veteran of the flight team and everyone's favorite, was appointed as commander. Grissom was already 40 years. He worked his way up to the rank of lieutenant colonel of the Air Force, but still had a little boy inside of him. He was the lowest astronaut of all. Moreover, he was initially rejected at the last stage of the selection. Did I mention that only people with absolute health were accepted as astronauts? And so Grissom was found to have hay fever, which is essentially an allergy to pollen. So the path to space was close to him. But Grissom raised a terrible row, like, are you guys nuts? There's no pollen in space. The doctors thought about it and agreed that there really wasn't any pollen in space. That's how Grissom got into the team. First time he flew into space on Mercury, the second one. That means Grissom became the second American in space. After landing in the ocean, the capsule filled with water and the astronaut almost drowned. But this didn't stop him. In 1965, he was appointed as captain of the first manned Gemini, and so Grissom really wanted to be the first to try out the new Apollo ship. The Apollo crew consisted of three people. Besides Grissom, there was Edward White and Roger Chaffee. Of all the three, only Chaffee hasn't been into space. He was only 31 years old. He got into the astronaut team just recently, during the third recruitment in 1963. Few people in Houston knew him. Chaffee didn't like to talk about himself. It was known about him that he played in the orchestra and played football at school. And that was basically it. But he understood the techniques well. Probably better than any other astronaut from the first set. Chaffee could be called a classic introverted nerd. If it wasn't for his athletic build and a career in military, of course. The start of the first crew was planned for November then for December, postponed to January and then announced at the end of February 1967. Thing is, something was constantly going wrong during training. The life support system and fuel lines were the most messed up. Right before the Christmas holidays, the astronauts tried on new spacesuits. Two weeks before, another test pilot almost died in such a spacesuit. He worked in a vacuum and the oxygen pipeline suddenly shut down. Two technicians miraculously managed to save him and receive the awards from the director of the center for this. Now everything seemed repaired and strengthened. On January 6, the Apollo was delivered to the launch pad. Along with the Saturn 1B rocket, he was solemnly waiting for the launch, which was scheduled for February 21. The preparation for this day was as if the big holiday was ahead. Television equipment was installed in the Apollo command module so that astronauts could transmit from space. 
Training to use this equipment was the last stage of training for the crew. In fact, everything was ready for a launch. On one of the pre-launch days, the singing ceremony of the treaty on the peaceful use of outer space was held at the White House. Von Braun and several astronauts, including Neil Armstrong, were at President Johnson's reception. So, it happened that during the solemn reception at Cape Canaveral, some wild stuff was happening. Apollo's team had a regular training inside the ship. Everything seemed as usual when the signaler suddenly heard the anxious voice of one of the astronauts. A fire. A small fire. The operators rushed to look at the screen which showed what was happening inside the Apollo. But it immediately lit up and turned off very suddenly. The doctors at their control panel noticed a strong increase in the astronaut's heart rate. On the other console, a scale which showed the temperature inside the capsule crept up. The anxious voice came out of the speakers again. This time it was louder. A fire in the cabin. It was Edward White shouting. But at first they didn't even recognize him. In three seconds the scream was repeated. A big fire in the spaceship. Well, okay, it was no longer a scream, but a blood-curdling wail. It wasn't possible to understand who was shouting at all. But it was quite clear that something terrible was happening. So what happened? The atmosphere inside Apollo consisted of pure oxygen. And this is a very flammable gas. It doesn't burn itself, but actively supports the burning of everything that burns. So a small flash in the wire under the seat of one of the astronauts instantly turned into a big fire. Instruments, consoles, and three human bodies burst into flames. They managed to unfasten their belts. Commander Grissom rushed to the hatch and tried to open it, but most likely realized that he would not have time to do it. White helped him for a few moments. Their bodies were later found right on the hatch. There were fingerprints and dried skin on the metal of the handles. The last thing that operators heard was the scream of the youngest crew member, Shafi. The scream of a man who had only moment left to live. We are on fire. Get us out of here. Despite the fact that I've been describing this scene for quite a long time. In fact, everything happened quickly. In between, the first report of the fire and the death of the astronauts. Only 40 seconds passed. The flame burned through the walls of the ship like a gas burner. Smoke poured out of the cracks. The rescue team rushed to the Apollo. They opened the hatch only after five minutes, and the doctors who came running could only sadly state that their services were no longer needed. The astronauts' bodies were disfigured beyond recognition by the flames. The news about disaster was delayed for two hours. First, the families of the victims were informed, and only then an official press release was issued. The dead were buried three days later, and the president was present in the funeral ceremony. Could this tragedy have been prevented? Of course, yes. But same thing can be said about any disaster in general. Nevertheless, disasters happen. Due to a mistake or an accident. Unfortunately, this is a feature of our world. It's technically impossible to predict everything. NASA understood this as well. Astronaut Frank Borman was the first to climb into the charred ship. And, by some amazing coincidence, it was Borman who at recent conference dedicated to his successful flight to Gemini, said, We will lose some crew. It's one of those things that you're slowly starting to admit. I hope that the public looks at things maturely enough to understand that we must pay for space not only with money, but also with our lives. Mistakes happened all the time. One correspondent estimated that the tragic fire was the 20,000th incident on Apollo. Even on the day on their death, the astronauts discovered many technical problems, the most serious of which were constant communication problems. There were certain interruptions and noises almost all day. The crew commander even asked irritably, if you can't hear us from five miles distance, then how you hope to hear us when we get to the moon. Newsweek magazine published an article with the following text. We were remorsely reminded that the moon landing competition is not a sporting spectacle when it's enough to pay for an entrance ticket and cheer for your team. 
The central goal determining NASA's decisions is not to explore the universe or just land a man on the moon. This is clearly an unscientific attempt to bluster up our ambition and pride and give the crowd a circus, a breathtaking performance, and a resource for bragging. But I'd also like to add the words of one man, dead astronaut Virgil Grissom. If we die, we want people to accept it. We're engaged in a dangerous business, and we hope that even if something happens to us, it will not delay the program. It's worth risking your life to conquer space. The fire on the Apollo forced to reconsider many engineering solutions. The full list included 1500 items. Hundreds of cost factors that could lead to fire were removed, though they couldn't get rid of the main one. The danger of rapid ignition was primarily hidden in the oxygen atmosphere of the Apollo, but they didn't dare to replace it. Even though many experts actually insisted on it, let me try to explain why. In Soviet spaceships, almost ordinary air was used for breathing. The atmospheric pressure was normal, but the American took a different approach. The astronauts inside the Apollo were in a low-pressure atmosphere, which consisted almost entirely of pure oxygen. Physiologically, there is no such a big difference for organism. But from the ship engineer's point of view, there's a big difference. Pure oxygen will take up much less space, which means the hull construction will be lighter. Also, the reduced pressure in space inside the ship created a smaller pressure drop. Consequently, the requirements for the hull strength were reduced. Less strength means less weight. And so it turned out that the oxygen was an inflammable gas. But it made it possible to make a lighter ship. But if the atmosphere is replaced at the last moment, then the entire construction will have to be redone and retested. So the first start will have to be postponed for an indefinite time. It's not known whether the Saturn V rocket will cope with a new weight. No one knows if changes would have to be made. And redesigning a rocket is a redesign of the launch pad. That's further a month of work and millions of dollars. And while the Americans will be making Apollo as safe as possible, the Soviet Union will be able to get ahead and set a man earlier to the moon. And then the entire national prestige will be completely undermined. And so this is a case of technical task turned into a political problem. Nevertheless, engineers try to do their best to make a ship safer than it was. The date of the first Apollo flight was postponed for two years, so active improvements were being done all the time. However, they had to finish not only a lunar module, but a rocket. Saturn V hasn't launched still. The second stage was especially bad. In May 1966, during a test launch, this stage exploded and broke into pieces. The work schedule was four months behind. Trying to get my head. It's one of your legs. Instead of behind it. Черную дыру это все. Я хочу горячую, вкусную, хрустящую пиццу с пепперони. Казалось бы, звучит как полнейший бред. Минус за окном. Ну, в смысле, за иллюминатором космос и минус 270 градусов Цельсия. Даже если кто-то как-то умудрится запульнуть пиццу прямо сюда, она сто процентов превратится в ледышку. Но не все так просто. Если горячая пицца будет выброшена прямо из станции, то да, она замерзнет. Но далеко не сразу, а через несколько лет. Потому что пространство космоса сильно разряжено. Здесь очень и очень редко встречаются какие-нибудь молекулы, атомы, то есть практически вакуум. А это значит, что молекулам пиццы не с чем будет сталкиваться, чтобы отдать тепло и начать остывать. Вы скажете, что пицца все равно превратится в ледышку из-за воды в пиццы. Она-то точно остынет и превратится в лед. Но нет, вода испарится моментально из-за низкого давления. Так что чисто теоретически 
Если очень захотеть, можно съесть горячую пиццу в космосе. И совершенно точно вкусную, если это додо. The first flight of Saturn V was planned for January 1967, but an endless series of breakdowns and failures pushed the date further and further. Already at the Cosmodrome, during the control of the first stage engines, they suddenly discovered inside a screw bolt. I mean, it was just lying there. The launch was postponed again from March to May, from May till the end of summer, then over to autumn, and this in the US. I mean, they took the deadline date so seriously there, as if they were laws. The fact that these deadlines were constantly disrupted was the maker of the unusual nature of the project. So, November 9, 1967, Saturn V finally took off. With a terrible roar, a huge rocket rose to the zenith. Scientists and engineers controlled literally every moment of this giant's life. And it's not a figure of speech. Basically, about 3,000 different parameters were measured then. This was the first full-fledged training session of the entire lunar program. The rocket lifted Apollo 4 unmanned vehicle into the air. It successfully flew to the moon, circled it several times and returned safely to Earth. It landed in the ocean just 10 kilometers from the settlement point. Amazing accuracy. From the ocean it was first taken to Pearl Harbor, and from there it was sent to California, to an aircraft factory where engineers could study the lunar module in detail. And by the way, if you have the impression that I'm somehow scolding the Americans here, since it seems that I expose their constant mistakes, then it's not like this. Technical failures are a normal phenomenon, especially when the level of complexity that the lunar program implied. The number of parts of the rocket and space complex was measured in millions. There were 64 kilometers of wire in the small lunar module alone. Two radio stations, two radars, six rocket engines, a computer, and much more. Saturn V was also not just a giant item filled to the brim with fuel. An extremely complex vehicle. We could begin with by saying that it was the most powerful of all the rockets that ever existed at that time. Werner von Braun, its chief engineer, said, Saturn shouldn't be considered just a grown-up V2. It's like considering a Boeing 707 to be a grown-up Wright Brothers airplane. The only thing that V2 and Saturn V have in common is that both function according to Newton's third law. Security issues of course remained. Saturn V was launched only twice, and in one of them the rocket simply exploded. There were issues regarding Apollo itself too. Everyone was sure that there would be at least one more test flight without people. But the program managers recommended that the third launch be carried out immediately with the participation of pilots. The head of NASA Webb took these recommendations to the Senate, to the Commission of Aeronautics and Space Exploration. The plan was approved. You can ask, how come? Didn't the fire on the first Apollo teach them anything? Why rush and take such risks? But it's actually believed that that particular fire tragedy helped prevent many other accidents. It's not for nothing that there's a saying that safety rules are written in blood. Experts have done everything to ensure that such situations don't happen again. And fair enough, they never happen again. At least in the Apollo program. In the summer of 1968, there were rumors that 62-year-old James Webb would leave NASA, waiting in vain for his main start in life, a flight to the moon. Instead, President Lyndon Johnson nominated Thomas Paine, which would be a unique substitute. Paine was born in the family of naval officer and wanted to become a sailor himself, but they didn't take him because of health issues. Everything changed when the United States entered World War II. At the time, medical contraindications for the service were already overlooked, and Paine got on a submarine. What's more interesting, he didn't stay in the army after the victory. He became interested in science and entered Stanford, graduated with respects, and got engaged in development of nuclear. Later, he joined the General Electric Corp, and began to build a career as an administrator. He got into NASA at the personal invitation of the US president, when he was already preparing substitution for Webb, 
so appointment of Payne to the post of head of NASA was logical and predictable. The last calculations and approvals of the Apollo flight were already under Payne's supervision. For the next year and a half, the plan was as follows. The first flight was a test of Apollo on Earth orbit. The second is the test of the lunar module there. Third, fly to the moon and return. The fourth is a full rehearsal. And finally, the fifth flight was supposed to end with the astronauts landing on the lunar surface. It's kind of funny that the second stage immediately went sideways, since the lunar cabin was still not ready. The flight of the ship around the moon took place without the thing that was supposed to land directly on the moon. The busiest days of Cape Canaveral started. Never before have three spaceships been prepared to be launched at once. The work reached its maximum intensity and went day and night. From the side it looked like the result of an important battle was on the line. I mean, they tried to do everything not only carefully, but also very quickly. The launch pad of the Cosmodrome resembled a military camp. So, on the morning of October 11 in 1968, Apollo 7 entered the orbit, and it was the most successful start of all that had taken place before. Three hours after launch, the spacecraft performed its first maneuver, undocked from the second stage of the rocket, and then conducted an imaginary docking with it. By the way, it was a flight with astronauts on board. According to the plan, they were supposed to orbit the Earth for 11 days. Why so long? That's how long the trip to the moon and back should have lasted. It was necessary to assess how comfortable people would feel spending so much time in space. For the first time, astronauts could warm up their food by syringing hot water into dehydrated concentrates. The food itself was also much more varied than before, from stew to pineapple cake. There was special toothpaste without foam toilet napkins and towels. In general, astronauts could do almost anything except for shaving. At that time, the Space Razor vacuum cleaner had not yet been invented, so they returned to Earth rather bearded. The safe return of the first three astronauts and the entire success of the flight inspired everyone who worked on the Apollo program. The decision on the second flight was made right when the first crew was hanging out in the orbit. The main danger of the next launch was that until then, people had not flown so far into space. The new crew had to first get to the moon, fly around it, and return. The newspapers rightfully called it the most ambitious and risky flight in all the history. And it wasn't just about the distance. If an astronaut could make an emergency landing at any minute while flying in orbit, that it was almost impossible to arrange such a maneuver on the way to the moon. Even in case of serious accident, it would take days to get back. Actually, every maneuver on the way there and back could pose a serious threat. If the ship's engine suddenly refused to turn on again in orbit around the moon, then no force would be able to return Apollo to the Earth, and it was necessary to turn on this engine at the moment when the ship was on the backside of the moon. That is, without communication with the control center in Houston, all this only increased the nervousness. While returning back, a slight deviation up from the trajectory could lead to the fact that Apollo would miss the Earth and fly to God knows where. A slight downward deviation on the contrary would make the entry into the atmosphere too abrupt, and astronauts would experience unreal overpressure at best. Such maneuver has been performed only once so far, on an unmanned ship which was also launched into space by different rocket, not Saturn V. In general, NASA had a lot of reasons to worry. English astronomer Bernard Lovell gave a lecture where he methodically listed all the dangerous situations. At the end he added, The thought of this flight distresses me. It's ridiculously stupid. Well, maybe it's stupid, but necessary to fly. Just necessary. Not also the president talked about it, but also astronauts. Not to mind the fact that Apollo 8 wasn't actually fully finished. The flight was perceived as a necessity. The main and only task of the second crew was to circumnavigate the moon. No other goals, including scientific ones, weren't planned. And if someone suddenly asked NASA executives about this at conferences, they frowned with displeasure and tried to turn the conversation to another topic. The goal is not to conduct scientific research, but to take an important step in developing our ability 
to land people on the moon. The step was taken on December 21 in 1968, before the launch commander of the ship Frank Borman reported, Attention, I am Gemini 8. But suddenly there was a chorus of laughter of the other side of the line. The operator corrected the puzzled astronaut and said, Man, relax. You used to fly on Gemini, and now you're flying on the Apollo. Mistakes like these happen. There were too many unusual things in this flight. For the first time, a man went so far into space from his home planet. For the first time, he could see the globe as a sphere, not just a large hemisphere. The emotional palette of Borman and his friends' journey were extremely rich. When we went out on a trajectory that has never been flown before, something has changed in me psychologically. The view of the Earth shook me. It was hard to believe that there were so many trouble there. Hunger, wars, national conflict. I strongly felt that all of us are a part of Earth. Air, water, and clouds. And by the way, there were cameras inside the ship. And it just happened so that American TV broadcasted several times right from the cabin. For the first time, such an incredible number of people saw our planet from a different point of view. What was kind of funny is that one of the viewers happened to be Samuel Sheraton, secretary of the only one Flat Earther movement in Britain at the time. And you know what he did after watching the footage? He spoke and said that the time has come for people to change their point of view about certain matters. Back then, Flat Earthers didn't really think they could doubt and claim that certain footages and photos from space were fake. The flight seemed to be okay, no equipment failure. Although things weren't all that well on the health front, Borman had a severe headache. He began vomiting and had a sore stomach. There was no way they could find out what exactly was wrong. But back on Earth, many believed that those were the symptoms of stomach flu. Especially because not that long ago, they almost had an epidemic of sorts. Even President Johnson, who visited Cape Canaveral, got into the hospital. And so Borman was feeling weak and sore up until they reached the moon. Other crew members also began to feel worse, although not as bad. When they got closer to the moon, they started to feel better. Perhaps not even because they got physically better, but because the view they saw outreached every other sense in themselves. Houston asked them to try to describe their feelings at the time, but the crew members were just silent because they were so amazed at what they saw. When we orbited the moon, we behaved like tourists on a bus. All the time we could hear exclamations, Oh look! Oh look what's here! This is a black and white world that has no colors. Colors in space exist only on Earth. The Earth is the most beautiful thing we can see there. People on Earth don't even realize what they have. Third member of the crew, Bill Anders, turned out to be the most reasonable person. When Apollo flew very close to the moon, he tried to find volcano craters, lava flows, or something like that, as he was told at NASA, to prove volcanic activity on the Earth's satellite. But he didn't find anything. He saw that the far side of the moon looked like a battlefield. There were only pits and craters. He expected to see mountains, but there were very few of them. The lunar surface reminded Anders of a dirty, deserted beach. In general, to all appearances, the moon turned out to be just a stone. The last important stage of the mission remained, leaving the satellite orbit and heading towards home. Everyone was tormented by one question. Will the engine turn on? It especially worried engineers in Houston, because due to the fact that Apollo was on the other side of the moon, there was no connection with it. Countdown numbers flushed on the screen. 10 seconds, 5, 1. Now the flame should have shot up from the ship and sent it back to Earth. But to find out if it worked, they had to wait until Apollo emerged from behind the moon. For long minutes, the communication officer from Mission Control repeated monotonously. This is Houston, Apollo 8. Do you copy? This is Houston, Apollo 8. You copy? And suddenly, a muffled voice came from the speakers. This is Apollo 8. We turn on the engines, everything is fine. In reply, the officer, not being shy about his delight, exclaimed, Say more. It's so nice to hear from you. Christmas was coming. The astronauts even joked that they saw Santa Claus's light flying to Earth. 
There was a festive dinner on the Apollo board, and even a bottle of cognac. They ate dinner, but didn't dare to drink. Anything might have happened, so no one wanted to risk and lose mind. As a result, Cognac landed safely with the astronauts. That was the reason why its owner, Frank Borman, was offered world of money. After all, this was the only bottle of Cognac in history that flew around the moon, but Borman didn't sell it. You would think, why not actually sell it? Did astronauts have such a big salary? Not really as it happens. There weren't any cash bonuses for the flight into space. Then why did Borman refuse to sell the cognac? Was it really out of principle and pride? Well, that may be so. But there was another reason. Before the flight, different newspapers and magazines signed contracts with each of the astronauts. Good fees were promised for each of their picture from space, as well as for each interview and participation in TV shows and advertisements. This income made astronauts significantly rich people not the flight itself. All in all, Apollo 8 successfully reached Earth and landed in the ocean. The landing was probably the only thing that caused problems. The ship turned upside down on a wave and water began to flow inside through ventilation. The astronauts got seasick. The Apollo commander was especially seasick. However, in contrast with the whole flight, this could be called a picnic. This is how the journey of the ship that opened the new stage of history of cosmonautics ended. The flight of a man to another celestial body. It was the result of work of hundreds of American scientists, engineers, technicians who created the equipment, calculated the flight path, and performed thousands of other jobs. Everything combined made this achievement possible. And then it was time to celebrate. Glory was waiting for the astronauts. White House reception, several countries international tour. Frank Borman even visited the Soviet Union. Then he worked for NASA for two more years, and then joined politics. Borman became the US president's representative for the prisoners of war. He traveled the world a lot and worked for the release of the American military in Vietnam. And after the army left Vietnam, Borman became a top manager at a major airline. In short, his life was quite successful. And then happened something that was supposed to happen. After one triumph, any repetition of it no longer caused such emotions. The next two flights didn't interest the American public so much, although all of those flights were technically more difficult than the previous one. From a casual consumer's point of view, what has changed? Apollo 9 was flying around the Earth again. Apollo 10 flew back to the moon. What's so interesting about it? People were now waiting for a completely different sight, landing on the surface. But of course without Apollo 9 and 10, no instant landing would have happened. The 9th Apollo actually flew into space for the first time with a lunar cabin on board. It was finalized literally on the go, without any weekend breaks. The main goal of the new mission was to work out all the maneuvers between the command and lunar modules in the orbit of an artificial Earth satellite. And here I need to make a short technical excursus so you can imagine the core of the problem. The geometry of the Saturn V rocket and the safety conditions of the launch required that the command module in which the astronauts sit be located at the very top of the entire rocket and space complex. Only the emergency rescue system is located above, which in case of an accident at the start or at the beginning of the climb out, rips the spacecraft with astronauts from the rocket like a hat from the head and throws it into a safe distance. In this case it turns out that the lunar module should be located below, under the engines of the command module. But then how to get into it in order to launch it to the moon? Make a hole somewhere between the engines? It's very difficult, but even if it was possible, the task would not be solved. How would the engine work then? Burn the lunar module with fire? There was nothing left to do but to revive the module after going into space. I mean to detach the lunar module from the tail of the command module and put it up. I hope you got it. Thus, to the maneuvers of undocking and docking at the moon, another undocking and docking at Earth was added. Of course, this complicated the work of the crew and reduced the system reliability as a whole, but they didn't come up with anything else, although they thought for a very long time. And here's the thing, the program actually allowed one vital emergency option. 
If while returning from the moon the lunar cabin could not dock with the ship for one reason or another, the two astronauts inside of it would have to transfer from it to the command module through outer space. The Americans really wanted to make this transition in order to show that they can actually do it too. To be clear, just a couple of weeks before the Apollo 9 flight, two Soviet cosmonauts went from one ship to another through outer space for the first time. In addition, as if out of spite, astronaut Russell Schweikart fell ill during the flight. He was supposed to perform that difficult maneuver. It turned out that out of all the tools and devices, people were the most prone to breakdowns. Schweiker vomited twice in the lunar cabin. He had a headache and lost his appetite. The question came up whether or not to report this to journalists. The head of the astronaut team, Dick Sladen, offered to keep everything a secret, and the director of the flight control center, on the contrary, said that it was stupid and unworthy to hide such a thing. NASA director Thomas Paine intervened in the dispute. At first he also didn't want to make a fuss and hit tapes with recordings of direct negotiations with Earth from journalists. But eventually, he gave up. Rumors about Schweikart's health had already spread through the center and the silence of NASA officials actually only increased nervousness and allowed NASA to be accused of lying. All in all, after assessing the situation, Schweikart's move from ship to ship was cancelled, but only for one day. A day later, the astronaut felt better, so he was allowed to go into outer space from the lunar cabin. Everything turned out great, but that wasn't the end. Next, it was necessary to test a scheme of undocking the lunar cabin from the command module and its autonomous flight. No one has ever done this either. No one could though, considering that this cabin was only recently constructed and set into space for the first time. Astronauts nicknamed the lunar cabin the spider because of its splayed paws for landing. So this spider was a very fragile structure. After all, it was built according with low lunar gravity. Thus, it consisted of mud and sticks. Literally, the wall of the lunar cabin could be broken through with a strong kick if desired. In the condition of Earth's gravity, the cover was easily pierced by a fallen screwdriver. The spider was made of metal foil, obviously not the one a goose in the oven is wrapped, but still it looked similar. If we choose a more accurate version of the terms metal sheet and metal foil, then the foil will be more accurate, that's for sure. In space, the walls became tougher due to the air pressure from the inside, but they were still not very strong. So, if something went wrong during the test flight and the spider could not return to the command module, then two astronauts on board would certainly die because the spider wouldn't be able to land on the Earth even if it wanted to. Because of this, NASA Deputy Director Miller said that the flight of Apollo 9 is two and a half times more dangerous than Apollo 8, and this is despite the fact that the ninth ship did not even fly to the moon. During these tests, the entire process of landing on the moon was simulated. First they descended, and then they dropped the landing stage, then they flew home to Apollo. The maximum distance of the modules from each other was about 175 kilometers. After a successful docking, the lunar cabin was shot off and it turned into a satellite. The first spider flew around the Earth until 1988, until it burned up in the atmosphere. The autonomous flight completed the most important part of the program. On March 13, the crew landed safely in the Bermuda area. Everything went so well that some of the high offices began to demand NASA not delay the moon landing and send the next crew there. But Director Payne didn't want to ruin the elaborated scenario. It wasn't invented for nothing, was it? And if there's a plan, then it's necessary to stick to it. The Apollo 8 was supposed to be a full rehearsal so that Payne could say with a clear conscience, we did everything we could. Also starting with Apollo 10, astronauts came up with the names for spaceships. Most often pretentious and proud, in order to emphasize the significance of the flight. The Eagle, Odysseus, Columbia, or even America. But the crew of the 10th Apollo named their ship and lunar cabin after the heroes of children's comics, Charlie Brown and Snoopy. So they try to emphasize that their mission was devoid of heroism. One of the American journalists said about this crew very accurately. 
they had to do everything and not go down in history, because all the glory will have to go to those who will follow their path just a little further. It is necessary to work out a schedule for all work, up to disembarkation and preparation for disembarkation. During the flight of the Apollo 9 lunar module, we learn that performing various operations in space often takes longer than planned. We want to know how long it will take astronauts to perform certain operations, to check systems, to prepare for the detaching of the lunar cabin. It is necessary to better understand the problems of navigation in the area of the moon. We'll be able to navigate exactly as it will be when we start disembarking on the next flight. We'll be able to predict the error with much greater accuracy and make sure that everything will be okay when we proceed to the landing itself. In addition, Apollo 10 was also assigned the duties of a lunar scout. This means that it had to find a suitable place for a future landing. This work was carried out by a special group of astronomers, geologists, and engineers at the research center in NASA. This group, having studied all the photos of the moon, outlined eight possible landing sites. All of them, of course, were on the other side of the moon that's always visible from Earth. Now, when the lunar cabin flies near the moon itself, it will be possible to make sure of this. There were a lot of different areas to film, and the astronauts grumbled that there wasn't enough film in the world to take all the pictures that were required of them. On Sunday morning in May 18 in 1969, Apollo 10 entered orbit. The journey of the moon went smoothly. The journalist noted that this was the first crew that didn't complain about the food. They liked everything they ate. When astronaut John Young was asked, what does your chicken salad taste like? He replied, you won't believe it, but like a salad with chicken. The only thing they didn't like was the water. It was very tasteless. It also gave them an unpleasant feeling in a stomach. Turned out, astronauts were given the wrong instructions on how to properly chlorinate it. The fifth day of the flight was the most difficult for Apollo 10. After checking the lunar cabin equipment, everything was fine. The commander was ready to give the order to undock, but suddenly it turned out there was oxygen left in the transition tunnel between the modules. For some reason, the valve didn't want to work. It took a few extra hours to analyze the situation in Houston. But in the end, the solution was found. By the way, with the help of a computer. And so everything worked. The lunar cabin moved a dozen meters away from the command module. John Young, who was left there alone, watched the spider slowly move away. After three kilometers, the cabin headed for the surface of the moon. The spider eventually flew at an altitude of about 15 kilometers, and astronauts photographed craters and hills without stop. It turned out there were quite a few flat areas, mostly mini ravines and piles of stone. But it didn't look too hopeless, and a place for a future landing could be found. Then, there was another challenging test, the separation of the landing and ascent stages of the lunar module, after which the ascent stage was supposed to begin lifting to meet with Yang's ship. For some reason the first separation command didn't pass, and the second command, stages finally separated, and the module with astronauts on it started to rotate at a very high speed. The astronauts felt like they were falling on the moon, their heart rate has doubled, Pilot Thomas Stafford turned off the automation and took control. He managed to align the cabin, and then it turned out that one of the control switches on the panel was in the wrong position. After collecting themselves, the astronauts headed away from the moon and soon safely docked with Apollo. They traveled separately from each other for 12 hours. Do you want to imagine yourself inside a spider? Here's how Thomas Stafford described it. In total, I flew more than 100 types of aircraft, and this was my third spaceship, but I've never heard anything noisier than Snoopy. It was too much. If you want to imagine something like this, let your children put a large metal saucepan on your head and hit it with spoons. Have you ever been inside a dog that barks, jumps, rushes in all directions? It sounded like you woke up inside a drain pipe from someone banging on it with a stick, like a drum. You gotta agree, it's not a lot of fun. So on the way back to Earth, astronauts rested and conducted TV broadcasts from the ship. 
That was the end of the test flights of the Apollo program. It was time to start the last and most important step. Everything depended on this step. Years of engineering work, billions of dollars, and America's national prestige. All of this was less than two months away. Getting a little ahead, I will say that on July 21 in 1969, when without exaggeration the whole world was following the first steps of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the surface of the moon, a comedy film was shown on TV in the USSR. Probably none of the Soviet viewers knew what historical event was happening at that time. But first things first. Even before the Apollo 9 and 10 flights in early January, the commander of the astronaut squad Dick Slayton called Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins and simply said, We've chosen your crew to land on the moon. Armstrong smiled and kept silent. He used to be silent a lot, but then he lost his tongue because of excess of feelings. He even told his wife only in the evening. Aldrin, on the contrary, was lit with pleasure and didn't hide it. Colin screamed, clapped his hands and jumped up to the ceiling. He was afraid that they wouldn't take him all because of his illness. Their joy can be understood. This was totally unexpected. Most observers claimed things like, other people would fly to the moon. Why these particular people were chosen? A question that remained unanswered. There was no clear cue for flights to NASA at all, but the history has shown that the choice turned out to be right. On January 9, NASA officially announced the crew complement of the world's first lunar expedition. Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon, endured the weight of popularity with dignity and never raised doubts about his competence and adequacy. This slim, calm, smiling and a little bit shy man in his younger years became famous for a record among beer lovers. I'm not kidding. A strange fact that doesn't fit well with the biography of a national hero. However, there was nothing else strange. In all other respects, Neil Armstrong's life story is quite traditional. He was typical American of his time, or someone who typical American would want to appear. In the Soviet Union, about the same thing happened when Gagarin was chosen for the first flight into space. Just a simple Russian guy, like everyone else. Armstrong was born in the year 1930, at the peak of the Great Depression, in a modest family, in a more than modest town that wasn't even on every map. Up until now, Armstrong's small motherland is famous only for the fact that Armstrong was born there. As befits a typical American, in the childhood Neil was a boy scout. He was playing trumpet in an amateur orchestra. Already at the age of seven, he started to earn money by cutting the lawn at the city cemetery. Then he went to work as a messenger at a pharmacy. He spent his money not on drinking and girls, but on aviation school. He loved to fly so much that he even got his pilot's license before he got his car license. The astronaut's mother said that his room was always piled high with books on aviation and airplanes drawings. In some sense, Neil seemed a universal hero. No special talents, but at the same time, he wasn't worthless. Almost complete set of good boy features. Doesn't smoke, drinks a little, distinguished by modesty and taciturnity. Armstrong's wife will later recall his amazing ability to remain silent in almost any situation. Neil is a man of few words. Silence is his usual style of conversation. If he nods or just smiles, it already means a lively conversation for him. If he says yes, it means that the conversation has taken on a stormy character. If he says no, it means that he is arguing bitterly. It took him three years to ask me out on a first date. When he proposed, I immediately agreed because I was afraid that the repetition of this phrase would have to wait a few more years. Already after Armstrong gained worldwide fame, journalists rushed in swarms to his home grounds. Everyone wanted to know how America's main character grew up. Friends remembered Neil as a kind of humble guy. They said that he never bullied or was interested in girls even, at least before the army. And there he was immediately sent to the Korean War and put on a plane. He never talked much about his missions. But it is known that he had 78 combat flights. And there the love of aviation was finally established. 
After DMOB, Armstrong moved to California and worked as a test pilot for seven years. He flew so well that he was entrusted with an ultra-expensive X-15 superfighter, which not only flew with incredible speed, but could also rise so high that the blackness of space was already visible above ahead. His life took place far from the busy city, in a small forest house at the foot of the mountain. His pals didn't understand what made him go into such a wilderness, but he liked it. Neil was going through a family tragedy. His little daughter had died. He suffered in silence and started loving his sons even more. He went out fishing, listened to music, and was somehow very free internally. The thirst for glory never pursued him. That's why when he wrote an application to join the astronaut team, it came as a surprise to everyone. Armstrong explained his action by saying like, everyone is trying and I want to try it too, why ever not? At first, Armstrong was just a civilian instructor at NASA. Then he started training himself. During one of the training sessions, he miraculously survived by jumping out of an out-of-control plane. And he did that with amazing composure. In August 1965, Armstrong became the official backup for Gordon Cooper, commander of the Gemini 5 spacecraft. After seven months, he flies on Gemini 8 himself. His ship went out of control, and Houston gave the command for an emergency landing. Not the most successful experience considering that during this trip the astronaut had to go into outer space. After that, Armstrong didn't fly for a long time. First he was appointed a backup on Gemini 11, and then a backup for Frank Borman, who was gonna circumnavigate the moon. And even before that, in May 1968, Armstrong had a serious accident while working on a model of the lunar module. The frail cabin of the simulator went out of control and started to fall. Neil ejected less than a hundred meters from the ground, and the parachute barely had enough time to open. Well, literally, Neil was on the verge of death. But already after a few minutes, he calmly returned to the shed and as if nothing had ever happened, discussed the small problems that had arisen during the tests. Okay, we've talked over the commander of Apollo 11. Now let's see who was supposed to fly with him. The second man on the moon will be Buzz Aldrin. Actually, his real name is Edwin, but no one called him that name. And not even up until now. And the old man is already over 90. Actually, it started in his childhood. Aldrin's younger sister didn't pronounce the word brother, meaning her brother. The only thing she could say was Buzz. Well, somehow it's been like that ever since. Aldrin was Armstrong's age, but he joined the astronaut team later. He was a career military man, the only son of Colonel Edwin Aldrin I. So a military career awaited Edwin II from infancy. He was brought up severely, almost harshly. For seven years in a row, Buzz went to a special Boy Scout camp every summer. He was always taught to be first. Because of this, Aldrin's character could be called ambitious and even boastful. But at the same time, he studied very well. At the age of 21, Buzz graduated from the military academy, then from the officer's school of the Aviation University. After that, he defended his doctoral degree on aeronautics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, one of three most prestigious universities in the United States. At NASA, Aldrin got a nickname the Scientist Pilot, or Dr. Docking. He was not only involved in flying, but also in the development of the Gemini program. He himself also managed to go into space on this ship, the last one. In the first mission, Buzz spent five hours in outer space. When he found out he'd been selected among a dozen other candidates for the role of a lunar pioneer, he noticed. I really hope I will have enough adrenaline to complete this mission. In general, I think you get it, that Aldrin and Armstrong were completely different people. They say this is how it should be in a very good space crew. In terms of marketing, also good. Buzz was just like Captain America, athletic, fast, agile, with the face of an uncorruptible police detective. He loved the audience, loved being in the center of attention. He spoke and dressed vividly. Colorful jacket, a pipe in his teeth, massive rings on his fingers. Speaking of rings, Aldrin wore three rings at once. An engagement ring, a military academy graduate's ring, and a Freemason's ring. That's right, they even got to the moon. But at the same time, Buzz remained demonstratively religious. 
regularly went to the Protestant church and told everyone that he prayed on the moon. In short, if Neil Armstrong was the usual regular guy, then Aldrin played the role of hero. The third member of the team, Michael Collins, also inherited a military uniform from his father, a famous general and diplomat. And in general, his whole family was from the military. Collins was born not in the USA, but in Italy, at the time when his father worked at the American Embassy. During his childhood, Michael traveled a lot with his parents. He grew up a beloved and even a little bit spoiled child. He slept a lot and was lazy. He also became an atheist quite early. Later he'll jokingly say that he stopped believing in God because the church service began at half past six in the morning. So the crew is ready. What's next? Training of course. A lot of training. The team spent more than 400 hours in the test ship. About 40% of the time was spent on exercises with onboard computers. Everything went according to plan. The worries of the director of NASA were mainly caused by just one thing. The problem with the launch of the spider from the moon. If for some reason engines fail, then there was simply no plan B. But there was nothing to be done. The risk was considered justified, because so far there have been no serious accidents here. So the eggs day has come. The launch of Apollo 11 became the main world sensation of 1969. Everyone knew what kind of flight it would be and when. No special secrecy was there either. Many congressmen, diplomats from different countries, businessmen, bankers and judges, and even priests were invited to Cape Canaveral. And those are only officials. Unofficially, about a million tourists came there. Hotels and bars earned $5 million in just a couple of nights. They were preparing a specially invented cocktail, Starts. And the legs of chairs were tied with straps so that violent visitors would not suddenly decide to smash them on someone's head. In the area of 100 kilometers from the spaceport was in a single free place in the motels. The hotel owners even drained the pools and put beds in there to accommodate as many people as possible. And rooms in private houses were rented for $25 a day. Now it's about $250. It was also necessary to put 300,000 cars and perceive everything that could happen with such a huge crowd of people. They got ready. A thousand boats, 10 motorboats, 50 ambulances, a military helicopter, and a thousand police officers were put on alert. Tension and excitement were in the air. The atmosphere of something extraordinarily exciting was supported by hundreds of journalists from dozens of countries. But do you know which country's journalists weren't there? USSR. Not because the Americans didn't let them in. No. They weren't allowed there by the Ministry of Defense of the Soviet Union. They had a fear that our reporters would visit Cape Canaveral, and then Americans would ask them to let their reporters to go to Baikonur. And this is a nightmare. Secrecy, state secrets, and so on. No way. That's why the Soviet diplomats, engineers, cosmonauts, and journalists were strictly forbidden to travel to Cape Canaveral, even if the Americans invited them themselves. Moreover, the invited person had to come up with some kind of excuse on why they couldn't come. Meaning, it was not allowed to go. And it was also forbidden to say that it was forbidden. The only Soviet person who was present at the launch of Apollo was, suddenly, poet Yevgeny Yevtushenko. He just didn't know anything about the bands. So when he was invited to watch the space launch, he just took off and flew to Florida without asking permission from the Soviet embassy. In general, the Cosmodrome was already full of media. According to statistics, three and a half thousand journalists covered it at the time of the launch of the ship. Then, for the first time, colored photographs were printed in the New York Times. Three pillars of American television, NBC, ABC, and CBS, together invested four and a half million dollars in advertising the flight. Even America had never known such a scale before. Enough to say that an ex-president, Lyndon Johnson, acted as a TV commentator. During pauses, Nobel laureate Harold Urey gave popular science lectures, and Duke Ellington, the king of jazz, played. As another action, they made up a confrontation with the Soviet Union. I mean, of course it was still. But then they found a kind of direct competitor, 
like the Apollo team was competing with the Soviet Luna 15 spacecraft, and NASA executives were pulling hair out thinking that the lunar soil would appear on the table of the president of the USSR Academy of Science earlier than they got it. The day before the launch, astronauts held a press conference. Journalists weren't allowed there. They were worried that before the flight, the crew might catch some kind of virus. And so journalists sat 20 kilometers away and asked questions via video link. The most popular question was about fear. Armstrong answered that astronauts are ordinary people, and like everyone else, they sometimes get afraid, but not at the moment. On a clear morning of July 16 in 1969, Apollo 11 entered orbit. The launch time was chosen in such a way that the moment the lunar cabin would land, the sea of tranquility on the moon would be illuminated by slanting rays of the sun. This made the lunar landscape more contrasting, and made it possible to see all the boulders and pits. After making one and a half Earth revulsion, Apollo 11 went to the moon. The difficult redocking of the lunar cabin was accomplished in the evening of the same day without incident. A successful start revealed the first wave of tension in the control center. The crew didn't conduct any off-duty negotiations with Earth, it was ordinary cosmic life. If cosmic life can be called ordinary. Armstrong and Aldrin visited the lunar cabin and made sure that everything was fine. Collins was engaged in navigation and consulted with Houston on whether additional orbit corrections were needed. On the evening of July 19, Apollo 11 clearly went behind the moon according to plan and started slowing down. Astronauts took their time. They circled around the moon for about a day, so they could aim better. Powerful computers in Houston processed all the data and sent answers. When and for how long to turn on the engine, to enter an almost circular orbit around the satellite. At this point Neil and Buzz were supposed to say goodbye to Michael. Before the docking hatch closed behind them, Collins shook their hands firmly and said, goodbye. I'll be waiting for you in 30 hours. He was left alone. I wonder what he felt being hundreds of kilometers away from home. What was it like for him to see our Earth, the size of a sunflower, in complete solitude and silence of the outer space? In the meanwhile, Aldrin and Armstrong were flying 110 kilometers above the moon. But there was no time to consider the gloomy landscapes of the dead world. The most important stage was beginning. The culmination of a long-term space program was approaching. As Collins watched the golden spider turn into a bright star in the black sky, then the star turned into a tiny comet. Collins saw the tail of the braking engine. This meant that the spider had gone to land. He was flying feet first, rapidly descending, even falling you could say. However, this fall was programmed. Inside the ship, it seemed to Neil and Buzz that they were not moving forward, but the lunar surface was flying directly at them. The astronauts sent a message to Houston that everything was going great, much better than in training. 150 meters remained to the surface, Armstrong switched control to himself. He himself considered this moment the most dangerous, but everything went well too. The cabin obeyed him and didn't mess up. And if they used a slide in a crooked line before, now they descended almost vertically. Neil could see that under him was a large crater, about the size of a football field. And around, there were lots of stones and pits. And there was yet another danger. If a spider hits a rock with one foot, the cabin would turn over and stand crookedly. In this case, it wouldn't be possible to take off back. That's why he had to look for a new place to land at the last moment. Armstrong made the spider hover while he looked for a flat area on the ground. He had about two minutes at his disposal. The fuel indicator was approaching zero. If the landing stage ran out of fuel before the legs of the craft touched the ground, there would be only one way out. To drop the landing stage and turn on the lift, otherwise the spider would fall and break. Later Neil recalled that those were the most difficult seconds of his life, the seconds he was born for. Medical control in Houston recorded Neil's pulse at 156 beats per minute instead of 77. They understood that the tension had reached its limit. Armstrong's reports became very short. There was no time to talk about all of those pits and boulders. Neil saw that they were already flying literally a few meters away from the moon, as the jet of engine raised dust under them. This dust was unearthly. 
It didn't rise in clouds. It spread out in a flat, translucent cone near the surface. So here it is, a suitable site, flat and empty. The probe poked the ground. After that, it was commanded to turn off the engines. The four legs of the lunar module stopped silently. Everything happened silently on the moon, as there's no atmosphere. The astronauts listened to the silence, unable to utter a word. They could neither report to Houston, nor to reassure Michael, friends, relatives, and the whole planet Earth. And then Neil said in a muffled voice full of excitement, Hello Houston, the Sea of Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Astronauts call their lunar module Eagle. Through the crackle of electric charges, he heard a distant voice in response. You made us all turn green with excitement. In the control center, everyone went crazy with joy. They jumped up from the consoles, shouted, hugged, waved flags. Then they listened to Neil and Buzz talking about the landing, craters, and boulders. It was time to explain everything. They flew over the crater and landed 6 kilometers from the settlement point. There was still 49 seconds of fuel left at the time of landing. The cabin stands straight. The incline is no more than 4 degrees. There's a flat plain around. A lot of rocks and a variety of craters. Very small and larger, up to 15 meters in diameter. And a hill rises kilometer away from them. Generally, everything's fine. They were supposed to have lunch and then go to sleep. But God, how can one ever fall asleep there? No way! The astronauts just sat and stared at the moon through the windows. They had little time. The life of the chemical batteries of the lunar cabin were designed for 41 hours. This was the deadline of their stay on the moon. In general, after a few minutes, the crew of the Eagle transmitted to the Earth that they would rest after a walk. They thought about it in Houston and agreed. It was well understood there that the most difficult stage of the flight was over. As for the equipment, leaving the cabin to get to the surface of the moon is still much easier than landing. Although it requires a lot of attention and may contain something unexpected, and in Houston, they also understood that the whole world was waiting for the surface. The humanity wanted to see a man not in the module, but right on the moon. The astronauts knew this too and prepared for the first walk especially carefully. It was unacceptable to stumble, slip, or even fall. The moment was too solemn. The first steps contained a great symbolic meaning. In the end, all this multi-billion dollar project, all these 10 years of work were spent precisely for these steps. But it wasn't easy to get out of the module. For 5 hours, Armstrong and Aldrin helped each other enter bulky spacesuits and check that everything was okay. And then Armstrong opened the hatch and moving on his knees, leaned out and began to descend. He was separated from the moon by 9 steps. Aldrin turned on the outdoor TV camera. How did Armstrong feel? He later said that there were no special feelings. He was just trying to be extremely careful. He lightly touched the moon with his left foot. The foot didn't fall into the dust, so everything was fine. And the next moment, he was already standing on the moon. The first step of man was imprinted on the moon dust. A while later, a physicist Robert Jostrow will calculate that this trace will remain for a million years due to the absence of an atmosphere. Meanwhile, everyone was waiting what the first man on moon was gonna say. I thought about it even before the flight, and mainly because a lot of people attach so much importance to it. I thought about it a little bit during the flight. Really, just a little bit. It was only after landing that I decided what to say. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. There's an opinion that PR experts on Earth thought this phrase for Armstrong, but I haven't found any proof for that. The contrary seemed to be true. Some experts tend to believe that it really was Neil's improvisation, in which he even made a grammatical mistake. He didn't say the article A before the word man. Well, that's too nerdy. Actions are much more important than words. So first of all, the astronauts had to learn how to moonwalk. The weak gravity of the moon was more pleasant and familiar than the weightlessness of space, and unlike terrestrial conditions, it created the illusion of lightness, soft, rubbery mobility. The displaced center of gravity due to the back on his back forced Armstrong to squat and lean forward. Later, the specialists analyzing the video will call his pose the pose of a tired monkey. 
it was easier to take leaps than to walk. From the side, it looked like the movements were filmed as if in slow motion. After 20 minutes, when Buzz joined Neil on the surface, they both decided to try to jump. And that was easy and pleasant. And Buzz even managed to jump onto the third step of the lunar module. The moon is a very convenient and pleasant place to work. It has many advantages of weightlessness in the sense that minimal effort is required to move there. With its gravity of one-sixth of Earth's, you get a very definite feeling that you are somewhere and have a constant sense of tension and strength. Although it can be erroneous, I would recommend future astronauts to spend the first 15 to 20 minutes outside the module just to work out a way to travel on the lunar surface. It turns out that in lunar conditions, it is not so easy to determine your position in space. It's hard to know whether you're leaning forward or leaning back, and how much. This led to the fact that objects on the ground seem to change their angularity, depending on where you look at them from, and how you stand. And for all the time we worked, we didn't feel tired. There was no desire to stop and rest. America celebrated. Conspiracy theories like the Lunar Conspiracy became popular in society much later. Back then, only in some bars, someone was saying that all this was staged and the greatest deception of mankind. But the number of these people was very little, so that no one paid any attention to them. Hundreds of millions followed Armstrong and Aldrin work on the moon. Only the Soviet Union and China didn't broadcast live. In USSR, only a few days later, fragments of the crew landing on the surface were shown. The ambience could be described in two words, admiration and gratitude. This happens quite rarely. Everyone knows the footage of astronauts sticking an American flag into the moon. The ambience could be described in two words, admiration and gratitude. This happens quite rarely. Everyone knows the footage of astronauts sticking an American flag into the moon. But that wasn't all. They also put the UN flag and 156 small flags of other countries next to it. By this, they emphasized that this was a common achievement, and on the memorial pennant near the flags were the following words. Here men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon, July 1969 AD. We came in peace for all mankind. A golden olive branch was placed next to it, a symbol of peace, and a little further away, medals with the names of those who dedicated their lives to the space exploration. These are Virgil Grissom, Edward White, Roger Chaffee, Vladimir Kamarov, and Yuri Gagarin. The audience didn't notice, but it turned out that the new US president, Richard Nixon, certainly wanted to join the common holiday, despite the fact that he had nothing to do with the lunar program at all, but really wanted to show that he did. At first, Nixon planned to have lunch with the astronauts before the Apollo launch. But this was strictly forbidden by NASA doctors, like you can't break the quarantine for the sake of show and PR. Then Nixon declared the day of the moon landing a day off and decided that he would certainly talk to the Apollo team on the phone. The New York Times hinted pointedly that of the last three presidents, Nixon was least involved in the victory of the mission, and his attempts to get into someone else's fame, to put it mildly, were unethical. Moreover, the time that NASA has arranged for the astronauts' actions on the moon was extremely limited, and the schedule was already so busy with tasks that it was difficult to abide by it. And here's Nixon trying to cut valuable time with his unnecessary conversation. But to the annoyance of NASA, the president managed to talk to Armstrong and Aldrin. By the way, the scientific program of Apollo 11 was minimal. Initially, it was supposed to bring an instrument package for conducting eight scientific experiments. The developer company received for this package $51 million from NASA. However, it was left on Earth. And so, the main scientific result of the expedition was that a person can live and work on the moon. In addition, the astronauts had to deliver samples of moon rocks. Armstrong had to literally collect the so-called emergency samples in the very first minute of his stay on the moon. That is a minimal collection that would be delivered to Earth, even if the ship had to take off in a hurry. The stones were something like material evidence, 
something that can not only be told about, but also shown and touched. So the stones were definitely needed. Besides stones, it was necessary to extract soil samples, install seismograph, a photon counter, and a laser reflector. With its help, it was possible to measure the distance between the Earth and the Moon with very high accuracy. By the way, this is still the simplest and reliable argument in disputes with lunar conspiracy theorists. From Earth, you can send a laser beam to the Apollo standing site and receive its reflection in response. If there was no reflection there, then there would be nothing to reflect from. Well, we'll have time to talk about conspiracy theories later. In general, the crew of the Eagle performed all the simple tasks accurately. 22 kilograms of lunar rock samples were collected. The installed seismograph recorded even their footsteps on the moon. Honestly, the scientific results were modest considering the expenses. But who could criticize NASA for this back then? After all, the main thing was successful. Did they land? They did. Did they walk on the moon? They did. However, they still needed a happy ending for a complete success. It was time for the astronauts to return home. Aldrin was the first to climb into the cabin, taking two steps at a time. The flight controller who sat in Houston joked that Buzz was the first person to leave the moon. Ten minutes later, Armstrong got up. When we returned to the cabin and took off our helmets, we smelled something. In general, the smell is a very subjective thing, but I caught a distinct smell of lunar soil, as acrid as the smell of gunpowder. We brought quite a lot of moon dust into the cabin on our spacesuits and shoes. They had dinner and went to bed. In seven hours, they started to pack to come back. They decided to leave on the moon some of their stuff. Cameras, soil sampling tools, bags, shoe covers, and various other small things. The engines roared and the cabin slowly lifted off the surface. As for me, the most pleasant thing was to see the eagle rising from the moon. This made me very excited, as for the first time it became clear that my comrades had coped with the task. They landed on the moon and took off again. It was a beautiful moonlit day, if you can call it like that. The moon didn't seem ominous and gloomy, as it sometimes looks when illuminated by the sun at a very sharp angle. It was a joy to see the lunar module, which grew bigger and bigger, sparkled brighter and brighter, and approached the exact location. The most difficult stages were left behind. Now it was only necessary to dock and land. The electric computer, of course, reported that everything was going well, but its messages were rather abstract. Can you compare them with the opportunity to look out the window yourself and make sure that the eagle is indeed securely docked with the ship? The docking process begins when the two modules meet and the probe enters a special hole. They are held together by three miniature side locks, and the impression is created as if the two modules are connected by paper clips. Considering that one module weighs 12 tons and the second one two and a half, construction looked fragile. To make the docking more rigid, a gas cylinder is triggered, which literally pulls one device to another. At this very point, 12 mechanical locks are triggered. The docking is over. The first step was to clear the tunnel by removing the hatch and the docking anchor. Then Collins flowed in zero gravity through the tunnel to meet Armstrong and Aldrin. He met them both in the tunnel. They shook hands and that was it. It's estimated that the cost of one kilogram of lunar soil obtained at the first expedition was 18 million dollars, which surprisingly classes these cobblestones with the most precious diamonds. After the astronauts docked and moved to the main module, the Eagle had to be shot off. The less excess weight there is on the way home, the better. The return flight passed without incident. The crew held several TV shows where all three shared their impressions. On July 24th, the eight-day journey was finished in the waters of the Pacific Ocean near the Hawaiian Islands. By the way, there was one more funny moment. Nobody knew how far space would affect people and if there were any viruses or bacteria on the moon. Therefore, it was decided to isolate astronauts from the outside world for some time. 
The landing capsule was washed with a disinfectant solution. Through an inflatable raft, the crew was given special spacesuits and then placed in a sealed van. Through the window of that van, President Nixon could greet them. From Hawaii, they flew in the same van to Houston, where a special laboratory was equipped in the building of the Man Flight Center. Fifteen more people who shared quarantine captivity with them. Geochemists, microbiologists, photographers, laboratory assistants and cooks. Similar procedure awaited for the lunar soil. The bags with it arrived in Houston even before the astronauts. On July 26, technician Jack Warren, dressed in a blue jumpsuit, started unpacking the first space package. The container was freed from three layers of sealed plastic packaging and immersed in acid bath. In the chamber where he was standing, the vacuum was brought to lunar limits. The container was pierced with a syringe to make sure there were no gases in it. And only after all these antimicrobial manipulations, Jack carefully unlocked three locks and slowly lifted the lid. The era of alien geology has begun. It sounds pretentious, but it's true. The dusty, black, very plain-looking pieces of lunar rock looked most like lumps of frozen asphalt. There was nothing remarkable or unusual about moonstones, except that they were from the moon. An article with an ironic title appeared in one magazine, a possible conclusion. They're the same stones in your garden, that's right. But when you think about how much work people have done to show us these stones, you realize their real value. The quarantine for astronauts ended in 18 days. Now the glory was waiting for the Apollo 11 crew. Solemn meeting in New York, Chicago, Houston. Celebrations on Capitol Hill, parades, dinners, a series of endless receptions and press conferences. A 38-day trip to 22 countries around the world. And a lifetime memories. The fate of the first people on the moon developed in different ways. All three astronauts no longer participated in space flights and soon left NASA. They settled in different cities of the country, far from each other, and didn't seek meetings. Strangely enough, this particular crew, unlike all the others, wasn't distinguished by strong friendship. Michael Collins was the Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs for a while. But then he found a more interesting job. In 1971, he became head of National Aerospace Museum at Smithsonian University. And in 1978, he became Deputy Scientific Secretary of that university. Collins wrote a book about his flight to the moon. With the beautiful title, Carrying the Fire. Here are some words from the book. Of course, I don't hope that in my life I will ever again have to do anything as amazing as giving the fire of space flights to others. But I hope that I still have a lot of interesting things to learn and this will allow me to devote my energy to plan for the future and not to reminisce the past. In an interview, Collins said that maybe it was even a good thing that he orbited the moon and didn't land on it, because the burden of fame and human attention is a very heavy load. And when he was asked if life would be easy for him, a man who would go down in history, he replied, Armstrong and Aldrin will go down in history, and I will look like the man who flew across the Atlantic second. Who even remembers the other person? Collins writes about Buzz Aldrin as follows. It all ended suddenly. Buzz was thrown away from the Apollo like a pilot fish from a shark, and started to swim frantically in search of something else, just as fast and dangerous to which he could stick. Aldrin, in fact, couldn't settle in life. This is evident from his book. Yes, he also wrote a book and called it Return to Earth. The book isn't really about space and the moon, but about the Earth. Return to Earth is a frank confession. Here's a little something from the book. We were presented as perfect, real Americans. I don't mind the real ones, but the perfect, we, like everyone else, had our own problems. The need to stand out was pressing. The troubles of domestic politics and rivalry were oppressive. The enmity in space program was exactly the same as everywhere else. We've become some kind of advertising characters, guys who had to attend certain meetings. 
we became people advertising the space program. We stopped being astronauts in the technical sense of the word when we finished the last quarantine. I've been to the moon. What I'm supposed to do next? Quarantine after returning from the moon was a paradise compared to what was happening afterwards. The day I was supposed to address Congress, I was in a state of stupor. I would rather fly to the moon again than play the role of a celebrity. The only microphones I like are the microphones in the cabins of airplanes or spaceships. I mumbled cliched phrases. I felt uneasy. But I had to smile and look the way they wanted me to look. I noticed that I wasn't acting at my usual level. Previously, I always knew what to do. But then I began to need to be told what to do. I felt sick. All kinds of sedative pills that I tried to live on didn't help. And I went to the doctors and said that I needed psychiatric help. It's worth noting that Aldrin's health was improved, but he had to leave aviation. For a while, he advertised Volkswagen cars and was the president of three small companies. He didn't like journalists, and they eventually left him alone. The only member of Apollo 11 crew who didn't write books was Neil Armstrong. Nixon appointed him chairman of the National Peace Corps Association. Neil understood that the appointment should serve as an advertisement for the corps, and he didn't want to turn himself into an advertising poster. After a while, Armstrong returned to his homeland, Ohio, and became a professor of aeronautics at the university. Even before the flight, a journalist asked him this question. What will you feel when you put your foot on the moon? He thought about it and said, I sincerely hope that the public understands that this is about the work of the team, and the choice of who will put his foot on the moon is quite random. It happened that the choice turned to me, but it could have turned to another person. He returned from the moon and didn't change his mindset. He avoided meetings with the press and lived quite a secluded life with his family on a farm 40 kilometers away from town and said that he just wanted to be a university professor, do scientific work. All official letters he would sign as Professor Armstrong. Armstrong understood that the lifetime title of the first man on the moon would always attract public attention to him. Every time they will expect something extraordinary, some clever phrase or heroic deed. And Neil also understood that he would always disappoint people, because he couldn't do anything greater. That's why he was hiding. The Apollo 11 flight ended a long time ago, and it had a very interesting sequel. But still, in July 1969, the Apollo program reached its pinnacle. Other expeditions could not be the success of Armstrong's team, even though they were much longer and difficult. These new expeditions replenished supplies of moon rocks, increased the experience of flight managers, strengthened the confidence of engineers and technology, and convinced Americans and the whole world of the courage of astronauts. These flights became the main events of their lives, which determined their future fate in many respects. But in fact, further expeditions after Apollo 11 were no longer needed. Everything that Americans wanted to prove, they proved. And now it's time to stop and ask, did they really prove? After all, the lunar conspiracy theory is still one of the most popular conspiracy theories in the world. It's as popular as the theory of Kennedy's murder and September 11 bombings. I understand that there's enough debate around this topic that with 100 lectures and a couple of huge collected works, and I'm unlikely able to convince some non-flyer who suddenly decided to watch my video. Nevertheless, it seems impossible to avoid these questions. Just in case, if you're interested, I used the book of the cosmonautics popularizer, Vitaly Agarov. That's what it's called, People on the Moon. So if you want to understand this issue better, then I strongly recommend reading it. I'll just do a quick review here. The point of the problem is the fact that today astronauts don't fly that far. Many people perceive this as a regression that needs to be explained. Today, the Flying International Space Station is easy to see in the sky during a right period and everyone can make sure of its existence. 
but the traces of astronauts on the moon can be looked at through any existing ground-based telescope. That's why more effort is required to verify the authenticity of the Apollo program. The idea that NASA could fake moon flights appeared even before the accomplishment of the Apollo program. Moreover, such assumptions were born inside America itself. And the more time had passed, since man's last step on the moon, the more supporters of the so-called lunar conspiracy theory appeared. In Russia, according to the results of VCIOM survey in 2018, 57% of citizens believe that there were no Americans on the moon. So, what evidence do we have of the Apollo flight at all? Lunar soil, photographs, filming, traces of people on the surface, accumulated technical experience, and scientific knowledge. All of this available for independent verification. Such verification has been carried out repeatedly. Well, the main proof of the flight is that there is no real reason to doubt its authenticity. Not each one of these points can be considered a confirmation of the entire program reality, but they can be verified. For example, laser angle reflectors were also delivered to the moon by Soviet lunar rovers. The Soviet Union received samples of lunar soil without sending astronauts to a natural satellite of the Earth. However, these samples were a thousand times less than the mass of lunar soil extracted by US astronauts. But you can take them and compare, unless you doubt the flights of Soviet moon rovers. And if you take a look at all the evidence as a whole, then the reality of the Apollo flight becomes obvious. Lunar panoramas and filming fully correspond to the landscapes that are observed on the surface of the moon. This can be seen when comparing footage with photos of devices from different countries. The astronauts left that same tracks, equipment and litter that can be seen on the surface of the moon from space today. Imagine what the level of standing should be so that Hollywood could manage to leave traces of astronauts on the moon for the sake of deception without even flying there. But let's move on. We have plenty of memoirs left. Each one individually can be considered convincing evidence, because anyone can be wrong or mistaken. But dozens of memoirs which complement each other and are checked according, available materials on Earth and the Moon indicate that all the work was real. Supporters of the lunar conspiracy sure that there is a lot of evidence of forgery of photos and films. That cosmic radiation doesn't allow flying. That in those years humanity couldn't implement such an intricate program. People write books about it. Documentaries are being made. Sometimes it's not easy at all to figure everything out because of info glut. For instance, someone shows you a picture and says, where are the stars? Where are they? Or why is the flag waving in the wind and there's no air on the moon? Being not used to it, you can agree with these arguments and think that all of this is fake and staged. There are many questions, but they all have answers. In general, if we analyze some of them, it becomes clear that the whole theory of the moon conspiracy stands on three pillars. Deception, error, ignorance of the facts. Here's an example. It's one small step for man, one giant leap. What do we see here? A so-called leak failed take of Armstrong's step to the moon surface. In the mid of 2000s, this video was promoted by supporters of lunar conspiracy. Like, here it is. Look, the deception has been revealed. Archive footage is now available to ordinary people. But if those people were a little bit more patient, they would definitely see that the video first appeared in the year 2006 on Viral Factory in the humor category and the address you can see in the footage, leads to the website of the company that offers advertisement in the center of London. And so, conspiracy theorists, as a proof of staging, used staging itself. And here's something recent. In 2017, in major and also Russian media, they showed this article. Donald Trump's science advisor approved that Americans never went on the moon. Can you believe that? What other evidence do you possibly need? The news was spoke about so actively 
that it found its way to Central Television. In the text, there was a quote from an interview with President's science and technology advisor and professor of Yale, David Gallantern. How are we planning to go to Mars with our current team in the mid of 2030s, when we haven't even been to the moon? The idea is as silly as Obama's administration. The moon landing is the biggest fraud in the history of humanity, even worse than all that nonsense about global warming. How come they even talk about it? Here's the name, the title, the interview. But it looks like the scientist with this name really exists in US, although he's involved in programming and humanitarian sciences, and nothing else. He writes books and articles in major American publications. But the most interesting is the actual source, website, World News Daily Report. Do you know what this website is? It's like Panorama in Russia. They even have disclaimer on the frontal page that all news on the website is for fun and not true. But for some reason everybody ignores this disclaimer and only noticed the sensational headline. It's funny that now the website is out of service, but the news is actually still available on 10 various resources, although without mentioning the main source. Another hypothetical hypothesis claims that the footage belongs to director Stanley Kubrick, who did Space Odyssey in 1968 so brilliantly that NASA asked him to recreate the landing on film. And people still believe this, despite that during space flights to the moon Kubrick lived and worked in England. In 2014 this version gained popularity again when supposedly Kubrick's last interview appeared on YouTube where he confessed what he did wrong. The confession was filmed in a way to hide half the person's face and make it harder to identify. The description said this interview was recorded in May 1999 and was stored for 15 years. The video spread again to many media outlets and journalists contacted a representative of Stanley Kubrick's widow who said that the man in the video couldn't be her husband and Kubrick himself didn't give such an interview. The appearance of the pseudo Kubrick also didn't match the remained images of the aged director, so that seemed like another hoax. By the way, its author himself hinted at this when he wrote that it was recorded in May 1999. That's two months after Kubrick's death. But all of this is fake. There should be real arguments, right? For example, why has no one except Americans photographed the landing sites on the moon? They're hiding it. But it's a tricky sort of thing. They actually did take pictures. Europeans, Japanese, Indian, and Chinese crafts did it, and all except the European one were able to see signs of human presence on the moon, including lunar modules, abandoned equipment, and traces of people. Well, okay, we can say that all of these are fakes too. Let's say something was photographed there. But it's still hard to see. If only some kind of device could drive up to the landing sites right on the moon and take pictures, that would be a proof. But the Americans forbid it. Did you not know? Here you go, read it. That's what it says. NASA forbids to drive closer than 70 and 200 meters to the landing sites of Apollo 11 and 17. But if you open the text of the document, you'll immediately find out what's wrong with it. Though, at first, you need to think, what legal reasons does NASA have to prohibit something to someone? They're not a political authority. In reality, NASA didn't prohibit anything. The document published in 2011 is a recommendation, the purpose of which is to preserve the historical heritage, which without a doubt are the landing sites of astronauts. Moreover, the proposed restrictions are related only to the landing sites of the first and last expeditions of the Apollo program. But the Americans flew there more than twice or even three times. And as for the rest of the modules, well NASA doesn't really mind them being approached and thoroughly explored. The main thing is not to try to unscrew the balls, because the ships are still American property. Even if the restrictions of 70 to 100 meters apply to all landing sites, it is still a close enough distance to verify the reality of lunar modules, human tracks, and placed equipment. Moreover, during the Apollo 15, 16, and 17 expeditions, astronauts traveled around the moon on special rovers 
at a range of several kilometers, and these tracks are clearly visible from the satellite. Well, okay, but how did the crew spend two weeks in oxygen atmosphere? After all, it's not the same as the Earth's air. Now, I've already talked about this a little bit. In space programs, the payload mass is very important. Any weight savings allows you to take more scientific equipment or increase in-flight reliability. Therefore, the first NASA manned spacecraft used an oxygen atmosphere to save on the mass of all unnecessary nitrogen. The air we breathe on Earth consists of 78% nitrogen, which is not involved in metabolism in the body, so it's practically useless. At the same time, a cubic meter of nitrogen has a mass of about 1 kilogram to 100 grams. That is, by eliminating nitrogen from the atmosphere inside the ship, you can save several kilograms of payload, more precisely, 16 kilos. Taken into account the reserves of compressed air, it was 64. Therefore, NASA decided to use only oxygen under reduced pressure for astronauts to breathe. This was a kind of know-how of the Apollo program, because in Soviet and Russian spaceships, there was always just usual air inside. The Americans also used this scheme with the advent of shuttles. Astronauts now breathe pure oxygen only during spacewalks. Here's another popular question of lunar conspiracy theorists. Why are astronauts cheerful and happy after landing? The basis for this myth was laid by the images of the Apollo 8 astronauts, triumphantly returning from the first lunar flight, joyfully waving their hands and walking on the deck of an aircraft carrier. Behind their joy and cheerful reports, the difficulty was not visible at all. The comparison with the current landings of cosmonauts and astronauts returning from long expeditions may also set wondering. Today's crews can't get out of the Soyuz lander on their own, and after being removed from the ship, they sit in chairs in which they're carried away in someone's arms to a helicopter or a medical tent. What's the catch here? The first space flight of Yuri Gagarin lasted 108 minutes, and the effect of weightlessness on his body lasted less than an hour and a half. In those years, people couldn't assess the effects of prolonged exposure of spaceflight's conditions on humans. For safety reasons, the duration of the first near-Earth flights was increased gradually. The second flight lasted one day. Third, almost four days. The longest single flight lasted almost five days. In the US, the difficulty was also gradually increased. Four hours, one and a half days, four days, seven days, 13 days. Compared to today, these are short-term flights, but back then, each of them was a step up into the dangerous unknown. The record for the duration of a space flight and an important limit for autonomous flights and spacecraft was reached in 1970 during the Soyuz 9 expedition, which lasted almost 18 days. Soviet cosmonauts Nikolaev and Sevastyanov had a hard time landing and returning to the conditions of gravity. After landing in Kazakhstan, the crew members couldn't get out and stand on their feet that easily. But in 24 hours, they were walking down the airplane ramp. In the airport, Adrian Nikolaev was able to lift his six-year-old daughter, so he did not require a long adaptation. Unlike Soyuz 9, the Apollo astronauts had higher physical activity and shorter flights. Work in a spacesuit weighing 90 kilograms and under pressure of less than one-third of the atmosphere for several hours in a row is practically weightlifting. To make sure the crew remains in shape and don't lose their tone, exercise equipment was installed inside the spaceship. Astronauts practiced with the expander 15 to 30 minutes every day. The modern ISS crew has to exercise from 2 to 4 hours every day. But even though they do light and heavy athletics in orbit, their bodies need to adapt after returning to Earth. In general, the secret why Apollo astronauts didn't have fatigue was in duration of their flight and regular physical activity on board. So what's next on our list? Personal favorite, because it sounds intelligent and incomprehensible. How did astronauts overcome the radiation belts of Earth? Near-Earth radiation belts are called Van Allen belts. And they indeed pose a certain threat to satellites in low Earth orbit and to crew members of space stations. 
The lower radiation belt with high energy protons is especially dangerous, because it can get even through the thick skin of the station's crew compartments. In many ways this is why long-term stations with people don't go into orbit above 500 kilometers. Although, in the case of interplanetary flight to the Moon or Mars, the Van Allen belts are not so dangerous because the ship crosses them quite quickly and aslant. For example, Apollo flew past the lower belt in less than half an hour. That means the radiation simply didn't have time to cause any damage. Also, the flight program of some expeditions included avoidance the thickest sections of radiation belts. The launching ship has the ability to determine, so to speak, space weather for several hours ahead using observations of solar activity. If a strong solar burst is detected, then the start can be postponed. The return from interplanetary orbit is also going on a second cosmic speed that is very fast. In general, the secret is simple. The quicker you fly through the Van Allen belts, the less you suffer from radiation. No conspiracy theories needed. As a tidbit, I'll add why the stars are not visible in the pictures from the moon. At first thought, this seems strange, cause there's almost vacuum on the surface. So we should be able to see the stars in everything. But for some reason, we only see the sun and the earth. This contradicts our expectation because it is known that the higher up the mountains, the more stars you can see in the night sky. It's not for nothing that large observatories are built as high as possible in the mountains. And all our experience suggests that there should be endless starry skies in space. Certainly, the stars are visible in space. Astronauts themselves have repeatedly described their excitement about the beauty of the starry sky on the moon. Celestial orientation was even included in their training program. So where did the stars from the photos disappear? This question should be easily answered by any photographer. Photosensitivity. The thing is, the sun is a very bright light source unlike the stars. In order that something is visible in the films, the photosensitivity was put to the minimum. Okay, enough about conspiracy theories, you'll still have time to talk to them in the comments. Let's take a look at what happened after the triumphant flight of Armstrong and company. What a trip! So, the goal has been achieved. What's next? NASA began to ask this question almost immediately. That's what they wrote. At the moment of the greatest achievement, the US space program is going through a crisis. The point of further flights seemed to have disappeared. The propaganda effect was achieved. The people were clearly shown where billions had gone and that this all wasn't in vain. So maybe it was time to end it. No one would rate highly repeating the record, and no less money would have to be spent. Public opinion polls in 1969 showed that about half of Americans didn't see the point in continuing lunar expeditions. Also, the war in Vietnam started and it made Americans worry no more or less. Turned out, the starry flag on the moon didn't arouse the storm of patriotic feelings the Apollo ideologists hoped for. Well, it actually did, but the effect didn't last too long. Student protests at major universities, a wave of anti-war demonstrations, these earthly problems were difficult to replace with another flight to unearthly landscapes. The Apollo 11 moon landing has become the end point for many enthusiasts of this program. Soon, a lot of managers, most of the astronauts of the first two sets left NASA. The heads of some space centers were replaced. Besides voluntary retirement from cosmonautics, many specialists saw the prospect of forced retirement. What this means is that there was a real possibility that everything would be closed and everyone would be fired because funding became much more difficult to find. What's interesting is that NASA had a maximum budget in 96 to 6, almost 6 billion. And every following year this figure decreased. The newspapers wrote that in Congress, while discussing NASA funding, exhaustion grew at every meeting. The lunar program seemed like a black hole for money. Therefore, suddenly, the richest US government corporation was forced to save money at every step. Even before Armstrong's flight, in one week, two regulations were enacted on reducing funding for certain programs. 
In February 1969, President Nixon ordered to find more money. But where to get it? Of course, take it from NASA. They have so much. In April, NASA's budget was cut by $45 million. The program of scientific and technical research in the field of aeronautics was cut by another 13 million. In September 1969, when the crew of Apollo 11 was solemnly traveling around the world, the Congress still said that 10 expeditions would be held on the moon. But it quickly became clear that the plan was unrealistic. You can launch 20 ships if you like. The question is where to get the money. So it was decided that the Apollo would fly only twice a year instead of four. And we'll see what happens next. Situation was becoming critical. Figures in the budget were not abstraction. They meant the reduction of another 50,000 NASA workers and employees. 16,000 people were unemployed in California. 11,000 in the industrial area of the North. NASA director Thomas Paine reassured everyone that the hammer was dropped for the last time. But it turned out it wasn't so. It finally became clear that everything was ending when Saturn V rockets stopped being produced. And there was no other rocket that could send a ship to the moon. Meanwhile, the president of the corporation which was engaged in the manufacture of spacecraft noted that the successful flight of people to the moon created a deceptive impression in society that the space industry in the United States was on the rise. In fact, their company had to downsize 4,000 employees when it became known about the production end of the lunar cabin and the turning down of the creation of an orbital laboratory program. All these troubles happened to American astronautics not by anyone's will. To some extent, they had already been programmed by the Apollo program in the context of its exclusivity. The pace taken was simply impossible to maintain, so problems had become a natural punishment for artificially accelerating the process of scientific and technological progress. They overloaded the economy. It was like they were trying to get off the crack, and there were no promising prospects ahead whatsoever. It wasn't immediately clear how far and dark this dead end was. But if you carefully review the initial plans for American space research and what was managed to implement, you can see that Apollo torpedoed many of the most interesting and important experiments for science. Because of the necessity of going to the moon, some important scientific programs were neglected. What are these important programs? All of them. In modern cosmonautics, there was not a single area which development wasn't slowed down by lunar expeditions. Apollo required monstrous sacrifices. This answers the question why people no longer fly to the moon. So let's see. Apollo prevented the construction of the Sun Blazer Interplanetary Station to explore the sun. Launches of a whole series of small automatic scouts of nearby planets were cancelled. In the year 1968, the Voyager project was closed, and it provided for the transfer of scientific equipment to Mars. A special microbiological automated laboratory was supposed to try to answer the sacramental question, is there life on Mars? Moreover, all these programs were relatively inexpensive but extremely important. They could really advance science and also give something useful to society. No. Every penny was invested in the Apollo program. In short, nowadays it is clear that it was Apollo that made American cosmonautics fall into a very long, unpromising stagnation, from which only shuttles started to take it out, which happened in the 80s. Meanwhile, NASA continued to launch the Apollos rather out of habit. At the beginning of September 1969, an Apollo 12 rocket was delivered to the launching site. And specialists had to think carefully what the purpose of this mission was. The main purpose of the first flight to the moon was just to fly to the moon. Science at this point was secondary, and the reason for Apollo 12 flight was that it had to deliver to the moon an intricate kit of scientific tools. The astronauts had to install a geophysical station with a nuclear power source. This station was supposed to inform Earth about moon shakes, along with magnetic fields and solar wind. The landing was planned in an ocean of storms 1,500 kilometers from the place where Armstrong and Aldrin landed. The automatic scout sent in 1967 worked in that crater. It was Surveyor 3. Astronauts were supposed to track it down. 
see how its two-year stay on the moon had changed it, and if possible, bring to Earth the samples of the materials from which it was made. The time of work on the moon's surface was increased from 2.5 to 7 hours. The commander of Apollo 12 was Charles Conrad, an experienced astronaut who flew Gemini twice. He was a backup on Apollo 9, and now he had to land on the moon himself. I'm talking about these missions, because these flights were also heroic. However, they are forgotten, to an extent that many people don't even know that Americans have been to the moon more than once. So little Conrad was distinguished by the fact that in difficult moments he acted quickly but calmly. Almost nothing could throw him off balance. He received a degree in aviation engineering from Princeton University, and military service didn't deprive him of engineering streak. Conrad worked more than other astronauts with the engineers who built the Apollo. At his suggestion, the cooling system of the lunar spacesuits was redesigned. He had long disputes with the designers of the lunar module. I spent half my life in an airplane with all-round observation, and I wanted the same thing in the lunar module. I insisted on making at least four windows, but the engineers didn't agree. The sun was very warm, and additional energy was needed for cooling, and the window frames were too heavy. I had to settle for two windows. Together, we decided that chairs are not needed in the lunar cabin. It is quite possible to control its standing. They blasted off on November 14, 1969. The first time of the flight turned out to be the most dramatic, when Saturn V just began to raise against the background of thunderclouds. Visually, nothing seemed to have happened. But in the control center, everyone jumped out of their seats. There was no electricity on the spacecraft guidance system platform for 12 seconds, and several emergency lights turned on at once on the astronaut's console. Conrad didn't hesitate. He understood what had happened, and knew that the automation itself would switch the power supply from fuel cells to chemical batteries. And so it happened. Except for this very first minute of flight, the lunar journey passed without incidents. According to his scheme, it repeated the flight of Armstrong's crew, as well as following expeditions would do. Conrad's very first steps show that there was much more dust in the ocean of storms than in the Sea of Tranquility. Unfortunately, the Earth didn't see any astronauts of lunar landscapes this time, because the TV camera failed. When the second astronaut, Alan Bean, was installing it next to the lunar cabin, a ray of sunlight hit exactly the transmission tube and blinded the TV camera. All attempts to fix it have come to nothing. During the second exit, they organized a trip to the surveyor, that same lunar rover that has been lying around here for a couple of years. They took out tools and scissors for cutting metal, bags for soil samples, and a backpack for parts. And they also took a 9 meter rope with them for safety during the descent into crater. They walked the crater around and approached the northern slope, next to which there was a rover. Bean started to descend and Conrad secured him with the rope. Standing on the edge of the crater, Bean was afraid that there would be a lot of dust on the slope and he would roll right down, like a slippery snow. However, the loose layer was shallow, and it was possible to descend safely. The slope didn't exceed 15 degrees. Astronauts have approached the vehicle. Just imagine their feelings. On the moon, they found the thing that other people had launched before them. So they were surprised that the vehicle that used to be white two years ago turned chestnut brown. They cut off a piece of the covering, took off the TV camera, and then took a picture next to the vehicle. Conrad demanded Bean to smile at the camera. But what for? You couldn't see a face behind the helmet glass anyway. And that's basically it. The flight of the next Apollo in April 1970 allowed concluding two important things. First of all, superstitious people became convinced of their superstitions. The spacecraft had an unlucky number 13, and the accident occurred on the 13th, and on a difficult day, Monday. Secondly, non-superstitious people once again became convinced that the technical perfection of the most modern machine is a relative thing, and two lucky cases with a lunar landing don't guarantee that there will be only good luck ahead. Long story short, when they returned, a new trio gathered on the moon. 
funding difficulties forced the start to be postponed from March to April. But all preparations were going well. So, when there was a week before start, some unexpected things happened. Astronaut Charles Duke fell ill with rubella, a disease that is not so dangerous but contagious. When the astronaut's immune system was checked, turned out only one of them wasn't ill with it in childhood. It was Mattingly. So they decided to suspend him from flying just in case, because getting sick in space is not a good idea. And so it happened that two newcomers started to work with veteran James Lovell, John Swidgert, and Fred Hayes. And from the very beginning, everything went wrong. At the launch, Saturn's engines didn't work according to the program. But it's not the main thing. The main thing happened when Apollo 13 flew 328,000 kilometers away from Earth. We heard quite a strong bang, a single one. I looked at Hayes, but his look clearly said, I have nothing to do with it. A wave of light vibration passed through the entire ship. Two seconds later, a red-orange alarm started to flash. It was 9 o'clock in the evening on Earth. Eugene Kranz was on duty. At that moment, the famous phrase was heard from the speakers. Houston, we have a problem. Eugene Kranz spat out a cigar and asked to repeat. They repeated. Okay, Houston, we have a main B bus underworld. It is now at zero. Looking out the window, James saw that a jet of oxygen was breaking out into space from somewhere behind. The instruments showed that the pressure in one of the two oxygen tanks was dropping abruptly. Oxygen was used in the life support system and the oxygen-hydrogen fuel cells of the main power system. So the main danger was not suffocation, but the energy death of the Apollo. After all, all its equipment, instruments, computers, communications, heating, everything required electricity. 33 minutes after the explosion of oxygen tank, Apollo transmitted to Earth there's no more electricity, everything turned off. Hayes looked at the remote control and realized they had two of the three fuel cells left. And so the moon landing was impossible now. He really didn't want to believe in it. It would be so interesting to walk on the moon. But at that moment, Lovell, the commander of the ship, was thinking not about the moon, but the way to return to Earth. Calculations show that it was better for Apollo to turn to Earth when it would orbit the moon. The thing was whether the crew would last 74 hours it needed to get back. Well, on starvation rations, it would be possible to survive. At that time, the astronauts who worked in the Apollo program were hastily called on Earth and forced to test the maneuver on simulators that their colleagues were supposed to perform in space. All the tests showed that the ship had to withstand. The crew showed amazing courage and self-control. They were flying, in fact, in a dead, dark, cold ship, hundreds of thousands of kilometers from Earth. Consoles were illuminated with pocket flashlights. The temperature in the command module dropped to almost zero. There was condensed moisture on the walls. Three of them were cramped in the lunar cabin. Hay slept in the corridor. Five days of such flight, Lovell, an experienced pilot and astronaut, lost six kilograms. They were so tired. They were confusing, simple commands, but they managed to come back. Before landing, for the first time in the history of spaceflight, astronauts were told to take Lexedrine, stimulating pills. The landing was an emergency, so it was difficult to calculate every step. It could happen so that the Apollo would land in a different ocean. Many countries approached the US government with offers of assistance, including the Soviet Union. Four Soviet ships that were not far from possible landing area of astronauts in the Pacific were ordered to urgently change course. Everything ended well. Apollo 13 landed, and the three tired astronauts couldn't hide their smiles when they were transferred to a rescue ship. President Nixon flew out to personally present the crew with the Medal of Freedom the highest civilian award in the United States. A couple of days later, an article appeared in New York Times. Now both specialists and laymen have been rudely reminded that a trip to the moon is not routine. Any assumption that will go off precisely as planned can only be vindicated through ceaseless vigilance during flight preparation and good luck after launch. 
It is perhaps appropriate that it was the Apollo number 13 that taught that lesson, the cost of which fortunately did not include the lives of three exceedingly brave men. And three exceptionally brave men did not know what to do, to be happy with their safe return home, or be sad that they didn't walk on the moon. But still, what have caused the accident? The commission found that the cause of everything was a short circuit. The system was changed, tested a hundred times, and it was concluded that now everything is working fine and there are no obstacles for the next flight. The commander of Apollo 14 was Alan Shepard, the first American astronaut who traveled in space. He's like the American Gagarin. By that point, he remained the only active member of the very first flight team. He really wanted to go to the moon, and neither a serious ear disease nor age could stop him. Just so you know, he turned 47 years old. He was the oldest of the American astronauts. Hinting at this last fact, his friends presented him a crutch. Shepard flew to the moon with Edgar Mitchell, commander of naval aviation and doctor of astronautics. Major Stuart Rusa, a test pilot who was 10 years younger than his commander, was supposed to be waiting for them in lunar orbit. On January 31 in 1970, they launched 40 minutes late because of thunderstorm and rain, although everything seemed okay before. And the trouble began at the moment when all trouble are supposed to begin, when they're not expected. There was a hitch during the docking, when the lunar cabin had to be manually moved from bottom to top. The cabin didn't want to dock with the command module. Attempt after attempt, but nothing worked. There was already a talk that the landing would be cancelled, and that at best, they would only be allowed to fly around the moon. The astronauts were terribly annoyed. They did everything right, but it didn't work out. They were ready to put on spacesuits and go into outer space to dock the disobedient module from there, but on the sixth try, they succeed. The lunar landing followed the same scheme as before. At first, it was led by an automation, and at the surface, Shepard took control. And this time, the emergency light was lit twice in the cabin. But Shepard showed incredible composure. His pulse didn't exceed 80 bits per minute. He worked as if he had landed rocket ships on the moon for several years in a row. The chosen landing site was very tricky. There were many stones around. Some boulders were up to 6 meters high. Nevertheless, Shepard found a gentle slope and landed the cabin 59 meters away, the theoretical calculation point. The scientific program of the flight was quite extensive and intense. In total, they had to complete about 200 different tasks. If previous travelers on the moon noted the ease of their movements, refused to rest and even allowed themselves various jokes, then Shepard and Mitchell worked extremely hard. They were especially exhausted during the second lunar outing, when they had to climb atop of the crater. It wasn't as easy to do as it seemed. They loaded the instruments into a two-wheeled handcart and set out. On the way, it was impossible to find even a 10-meter flat area. Pits and stones were everywhere. Astronauts often made stops. The closer they got to the crater, the bigger the rocks became. The rubber tires of the handcart were either buried in the dust or bumped into rocks and often had to be dragged by hand. The cooling system of the spacesuits couldn't subdue hot sun rays. The temperature inside the spacesuit reached 27 degrees. Even the patient shepherd said that hike was going very hard. As a result, they never got there. Earth ordered them to return. On the way back, the exhausted astronauts lost their way. In Houston, they were worried that the oxygen was running out. Finally, the travelers got to the place where the lunar module was visible. They crawled the last 400 meters for 25 minutes. Well, I don't see any point in describing what happened next. The takeoff was normal. The return flight was normal. The landing passed without incident. Except that by that point, NASA was sure there were no microorganisms on the moon and astronauts didn't need quarantine. But the US Academy of Sciences insisted on it. It was agreed that this would be the last quarantine among the Apollos. However, sitting in an airtight van, Shepard and the company didn't feel any better about it. 
Alan Shepard had always been considered a lucky man. Even before the flight to the moon, he showed great talent in the purely American part of making money. He was engaged in banking, brought up ground areas and stocks of various companies. After the flight, he was promoted to rear admiral. In 1974, he retired and devoted himself entirely to business. He became the first millionaire astronaut. His luxury villa is located in an expensive area of Houston. There are eight household stores in the city. At least they were ten years ago. I don't know how things are going now. The small town where he was born was renamed in his honor. But does this mean that Shepard became conceited? It doesn't seem so. He behaved quite modestly and didn't try to brag about the space achievements. He said, we are not heroes. We are just people who were lucky enough to get to the moon and back at the expense of the state. In conclusion, I would like to focus on one detail. At this point begins an abrupt fall of public interest in the lunar space program. Even during the previous Apollo 12 landing, which took place at night, almost no one turned on their TVs. And when people were asked why, they replied, I've already seen it. Moreover, many Americans set complaints to television because their favorite shows were cancelled because of the broadcasting from Apollo 12. If the launch of Apollo 11 was covered by 3,500 journalists, then Apollo 12 was covered by 2,000. The next one is 1,500, and so on. Instead of a million tourists in July in 1969, in April 1970, it was hardly possible to count 100,000. The interest in the launch was minimal. Flights weren't a show anymore, a scientific things didn't bother the public that much. However, continuing expenses at these launches did bother it. The loss of public interest didn't just upset American astronauts, it also reduced their income. I've already said that contracts with publishers of newspapers and magazines gave them more money than NASA paid them. John Glenn, the first American to make an orbital flight around the Earth, received $15,000 from NASA in 1960 and 17,000 from publishers. In total, all American astronauts from year 59 to 72 received about $5 million from only three publishers. Now the times were changing. However, I still have something to tell you about the two past flights. First, astronauts got a rover for the first time. It was a small electric all-terrain vehicle that allowed them to drive on the moon like on a rally track. It allowed them to drive away from the landing cabin for considerable distances. The rover cost quite a lot of money. For this reason, Apollo 15 went down in history as the most expensive flight. It cost them half a billion dollars. On the moon, the rover's front wheel rotation system quickly failed but it was possible to steer the rear wheels, so it wasn't a big deal. The astronauts traveled at speed of 14 kilometers per hour. This allowed them to explore a fairly large area in three trips. If the maximum distance from the lunar module for Armstrong and Aldrin were 60 meters, for Conrad 420 meters, for Shepard and Mitchell a kilometer. So now the astronauts were five kilometers away from it. On the second day, they made the farthest outing into the area of the Spore Crater, where they found interesting multicolored stones, including a shiny crystal of anothocyte, which confirmed the ancient origin of local rocks. During the landing on the Earth, one of the three parachutes of the module failed, and the speed increased to almost 10 meters per second. The astronauts were warned that the landing was expected to be tough. During the landing, they experienced a 16-fold overload. In the end, everything turned out well. Astronauts were safely taken to the board of the aircraft carrier. They were happy not only because they had successfully completed the entire program, but also because now they didn't have to sit out two weeks in quarantine. By the way, do you see that I also began to shorten the story for each expedition? The reason for that, I just don't want to repeat myself. Just like Americans 50 years ago, you will also not be interested in listening to the same details six times in a row. And so, I just try to focus only on the most interesting things. There is no point to lengthen the video on purpose. The Apollo 16 was remembered for another journey of astronauts on a rover, which also broke, but not completely. After deploying a set of instruments and drilling three holes with a depth of three meters, the astronauts went for a ride. 
take a look at how they drive. One of the astronauts said that a trip on a lunar rover is very similar to riding a camel. It was obvious that the lunar rover wasn't prepared for such a road. The slope indicator and the entire navigation system failed, and then the wing fell off. One of the tasks of Apollo 16 was to find traces of volcanic activity. And they didn't find it. Astronauts Young and Duke carefully searched for crystal samples that could confirm the presence of ancient volcanoes. Several times they made mistakes taking other stones for crystals, and were told off by geologists from Earth. After yet another mistake, Duke exclaimed that if the stone he found would be non-crystalline, he would immediately commit suicide by opening the spacesuit. Later on Earth it turned out that only 3 or 4 samples out of 100 kilograms could be volcanic. Also the last expedition brought one stone to Earth which revealed a weak magnetization. Some experts claimed that it was natural, others that it arose during transportation. The dispute had to be resolved by Apollo 16. They took a pre-demagnetized stone with them, brought it to the moon, and then brought it back to Houston. Turned out that the magnetization was due to the ship magnetic field. Despite the large amounts of research performed, this crew significantly neglected their work. But actually, frequent failures of equipment can serve as an excuse here. During 11 days of the flight, more than 20 problems were registered. That means more than during all previous flights combined. Not to mention the emergency Apollo 13. Yet, they needed to conduct an experiment with taken soil from a specific place. They took the soil, but somewhere along the way they lost a container with it. How was this possible? And that's not all. The crew needed to measure the heat flows coming from the depth of the moon. But Yang inadvertently tore the cable connecting the device to the telemetry unit and the Earth didn't get any data. Duke also dropped a container of instruments into the crater. The container was eventually taken out, but devices didn't work any better. And as the cherry on top, Apollo 16 was supposed to launch a small automatic satellite into orbit around the moon. And they also failed to do this properly. The satellite, which was lowered in orbit, lasted only 35 days instead of a year. That was a screw-up. These problems for NASA raised a question. Actually, it already was. Only now it escalated to the limit. It concerned people who should fly the Apollos. If lunar expeditions are intended for scientific research, then why not send scientists or engineers on the moon? Why are there pilots who ruin important and expensive experiments? Out of 12 crews, there were only 6 mixed. On the Apollo ships, the military flew 29 times, civilian 7. Among these 7 were such professionals as, for example, Armstrong or Brandt, who left the army only on the eve of enlisting the astronauts' corps. So, they were basically also primarily military. After the Apollo 11 flight, the New York Times wrote, The propaganda goals were achieved brilliantly. Now it's time to focus on less spectacular but no less important scientific research. But it didn't work out. Moreover, if the Apollo program needed to save money, they saved on science. Perhaps the most sensational example of this situation was the appointment of the Apollo 13 and Apollo 14 crews. Each of these crews had two rookie astronauts, but they were military instead of specialist astronauts who were civilians. The question was, how long? Even the newspapers asked, how long will our people be willing to pay for moon landings performed only by test pilots at a cost of $500 million per flight? Another newspaper didn't hint but talk straightforward. Like, who would control the Apollo programs? Be our people and military or scientists? Considering the fact that mostly scientists are retiring, the answer is clear. NASA tried to suppress the conflict and offered annoyed scientists the position of flight supervisors during next landings. But this option didn't satisfy scientists, because the new name had all the same content. Stay at home, you will not fly anywhere, and you will not make any decisions. Everyone understood. Apollo was about to end. That's why discussion got so tense. Everyone was worried about the question of whether, at least in its finale, 
the lunar program would stop being just prestigious and become a scientific research program in order not to depend on political tasks. The conflict was heating up. Scientists trained on equal terms with pilots, but these trainings prevented them from doing science. It was unclear what this was for. If NASA still didn't want to let them into space, it turned out that they were wasting their time. NASA executives fed them with promises. Like, soon when it's your turn, you will definitely fly. But in fact, they were quite satisfied with the way things were going. After all, the main goal has already been fulfilled. A man landed on the moon. But whether traces of volcanoes are found or not, whether gravitational anomalies can be explained, who cares? Now we have other goals to quietly wind down the program and switch to something else. And these people with their science, well, screw them. That's why NASA tried to gently get rid of scientists. They didn't say strictly no, but every time came up with reasons why they couldn't fly. Like, if the next Apollo returns safely, then maybe we'll send you on the next one. Apollo was returning, but the next one went to the moon again without scientists. As another sedative, Thomas Paine suggested creating an institute for lunar research to divert the attention of scientists for a while. The materials obtained during the lunar expeditions had to be carefully studied, discussed, consulted, written off with colleagues, and after many months, published in boring journals that except for scientists themselves no one reads. Meanwhile, NASA wanted quick, joyful press conferences, casual conversations in the light of colorful television studios, immediate society reaction. It didn't want the scientific magazines, but glossy. And it was not only about the different approach, but also the fact that NASA no longer saw any prospects for the Apollo. Why abruptly change the goals and tasks of the program when it's obvious to everyone that the Apollos will end soon? When it turned out that the budget had been cut again, and Apollo 17 would be the last, they decided that it wasn't correct, especially considering the fuck-ups of the previous crew. And so one scientist was lucky enough to finally visit the moon. It was a 37-year-old graduate of the University of California, doctor of geology from Harvard, Harrison Schmidt. And he really differed from the heroic pilots. He was small, shaggy, with shiny black eyes. People call these weird guys. Schmidt appeared in Houston in the fall of 1964. At first glance, no one would ever recognize him as an astronaut, cause an image of an astronaut was different. Real Americans, athletes, military men with short haircuts, exemplary husbands and fathers. And here's Harrison Schmidt, a bachelor, slacker, who never wore a military uniform. When they asked them why he hasn't married yet, Schmidt said he was a geologist. The Apollo 17 launched late in the evening on December 7 in 1972. This is the first and last night launch in the history of the Apollo. The huge red-hot sun of the Saturn V engines reflected in the water turned the night into a dazzling bright day for a few seconds. The start was beautiful, but it might not happen. Automatic locking system was activated 30 seconds before the start and didn't allow the engines to be turned on. It took almost three hours to figure out what happened. Both astronauts and NASA officials were worried. After all, there was not a very long period of time for a successful launch. If the problem had not been fixed within a day, then the start would have to be postponed for a month. This messed up plans and might cause losses of $11 million. But still, the breakdown was found and quickly fixed, so Apollo 17 flew after all. During almost the entire journey to the moon, the pilot astronauts remained silent. Eugen Cernan didn't respond to anything and seemed completely involved in his work, but geologist Schmidt uncorked his emotions. When the astronauts were on the moon, they first installed equipment 100 meters from the module. 13 scientific instruments were delivered. Nine of them were used for the first time. For example, two new gravimeters. The first device was supposed to register all the fluctuations of the lunar surface, literally all of them, from sun exposure and meteorites to the steps of astronauts. The second device had to find differences in the density of soil of seas and mountains of the moon. Schmidt was delighted. He ran from one stone to another and often fell when he wanted to pick something up. He said that he was a little ashamed that he, as a geologist, couldn't collect samples. But if there's a paradise for geologists, then he got to this paradise. 
Apollo 17 returned to Earth on the evening of December 19th. That's how Cernan and Schmidt journey to the moon ended. By all means, it beat every record. And for now, the last one. The astronauts stayed on the moon 75 hours. They drove the rover for almost 36 kilometers with a maximum speed of 18 kilometers per hour. They brought a record cargo of lunar soil from Earth, about 117 kilograms. Their flight was the longest, 12 days and 14 hours. And at this point, Apollo project came to an end. An announcement appeared on the doors of the manned flight center, where astronauts were training. The following trips are cancelled. It was time to think. What the heck was that? There was an understanding that the moon has become even more mysterious than it was before the flights. All this confirmed the law of scientific and technological progress. According to it, scientists gradually climb up the steps and with each next step they see wider horizons. And the Apollo program forced them to break this law and jump two flights of stairs at once. On one hand, this makes engineering achievements meaningless, and on the other, heroic. It's funny how America considered a country where absolutely everything's done for the sake of money. Strange how it dashed into a project that couldn't bring any profit even in theory. Economics are important, but politics turn out to be more important. And all scientific achievements of Apollo were just a byproduct of the desire to set a record. Back when Apollo 14 was flying to the moon, a scientific conference on the study of lunar soil was held in Houston. This conference was attended not only by Americans, but also by Soviets. After academic Vinogradov's report, a lively discussion started. In fact, he presented unique samples obtained by the Luna 16 and Luna 20 automatic stations, which cost a lot less than manned Apollo. To be more precise, 15 times. And the moon rovers actually caused universal delight. Turns out, it was possible to get same footage from the moon without risking the lives of astronauts. This doesn't mean that Soviet and American programs competed with each other. If Luna 16 is good, it doesn't mean that Apollo is bad. It can be called rather untimely. Astronaut Frank Borman once responded to criticism that spending $24 billion to land a man on the moon is a technical insurance of America's future. He referred to the enormous impact that the Apollo program had on the development of science and industry. According to approximate estimates, about 25,000 inventions made for the lunar program were later used in civilian life. Remote control devices and ways to create an isolated environment have come to medicine. Refractory paints and materials are used in construction. Synthetic fabrics are used in light industry. Special canning methods are used in food industry. There are thousands of examples. In general, Apollo began as a political project and ended because of politics. Perhaps, if it hadn't been for Vietnam, the Americans would really have flown to the moon 10 times and perhaps found a way to transform the program into something more practical. Well, it is what it is. Controversial achievement is still an achievement. It showed what humanity was capable of if something had to be done. And this inspiring effect should not be underestimated. Goodbye. Okay, that's good. Okay, that's good on the flag. Okay, Houston. 